it's now seven o'clock and call to order the regular council meeting for Tuesday, March 2nd. And we um, acknowledge that we are conducting our business today on the unceded yeah. territory of the Selic Okanagan people. As a council, we recognize the importance of doing our best to build respectful relationships that contribute to stewarding the land and waters in the community with integrity and consideration for future generations. And first up is to adopt the agenda. Councillor Kozub, Councillor Ireland, those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Adoption of the regular council meeting minutes of February 16th. Uh, Councillor Scarrow, Councillor Ireland, errors or omissions? None. Those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, no report. The Okanagan Central, Okanagan um, Regional District of Central Okanagan budget is in the works and uh, we've been doing that. Not a lot to report. The final will be about the time we drop our own. No announcements. No delegations. Uh, public comment. Nobody phoned in. So we come to development. Uh, oh, carry on. Do you have somebody there? Mr. Hastings, can you hear us? No, hello. Mr. Hastings, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, here you are. You're live in council chambers now. If you could just make sure the volume on the meeting is off where you are and council can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is David Hastings. I live on uh, Middle Bench Road in Lake Country. Um, I'd just like to address you. I have a issue with uh, garbage removal. Um, we have a carriage house property that was built with uh, a development permit, building permit, all the necessary regulations. Um, I've requested to staff um, on a number of occasions that I would like extra garbage cans provided at my property. Um, that request has been, I guess, denied on several occasions um, based on the fact that the building inspector feels the need to advise engineering that um, whether it's warranted to have extra garbage cans at uh, my said property. Um, I'm just a bit concerned that uh, they're taking it as a personal view rather than looking at bylaws or uh, the request of uh, residents for, for the extra garbage that's needed. All right, that, that's good to know. I'll get staff to get. Uh, uh, well, Mr. Hastings on Middle Bend Road, we should be able to find his address. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've talked to Councillor McKenzie on the issue a couple of times and he advised me to address you this evening. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Will do. Thank you for calling Thank in. Thank you for listening. All right. Anybody else? No. Second time, third time of asking. Okay. Then public comment is over. And uh, development permit with the variance.
Councilman Cove is a favorite. This is a min minimal variance. Yeah. Anybody presenting this? Nobody from planning? I guess uh, Mr. McEwen has some uh, comments uh, just to introduce the topic and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, so thank you very much, Your, your Worship. Just uh, presenting with the camera off, as uh, mentioned in the strategy session. Um, but uh, the first item before you this evening is an extension consideration um, for DP 2019-001 with variance at 9542 Jensen Road. I could go through the uh, the, the presentation for you if uh, you would like. However, knowing that this is just an extension of an existing uh, already approved uh, development permit uh, and, and variance, um, I can leave it to Council for consideration. Uh, yeah. Effectively, the the proposal is for three um, three units um, uh, on the on the property um, at about uh, 85 square meters apiece, and a uh, reduction of the um, of the uh, north and uh, south yard uh, setbacks. But it was approved by council on uh, July 21st, 2020. Uh, council has a uh, bylaw requirement that upon issuance, uh, there's a five month uh, period where uh, work must commence in that period. And if it does not commence in that time, uh, council may grant a three month extension. Uh, the applicant did request an extension at the end of uh, 2020. Uh, we've just had some uh, scheduling issues and getting it to you now. Um, so we do want to follow all of the uh, due procedure in terms of getting this uh, extended, although the extension would only be uh, really for the remainder of uh, the majority of this month. Okay. Uh, but that being said, wanting to follow process. Okay, I have Councillor Scarl. Yeah, I think you might have answered my question, Jamie. So the March 21st, is that when the existing five months ends and the extension would begin? Or are we granting an extension until March 21st? Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, and, and great cl clarification. In fact, the uh, the five months was at the basically at the end of 2020, and this would be uh, um, the extension. We've in fact already gone into that period. Uh, however, there was some communication issues uh, in terms of uh, the procedure in terms of getting this extended. So staff did want to follow due process and uh, wanted to leave this in council's court at least until the uh, remainder or uh, the 21st of this month. So it, okay. it does seem like a very short window. Though. Upon visiting the property today, I could see no evidence of any action taking place at this point. And, and I'm kind of wondering what 20 days is going to accomplish. Can you can you refer to that or? Well, it was just the uh, uh, thing that needed a covenant. But, uh, Councillor Gamble. Um, well, it, to me, it, it's a matter of due process, um, and uh, you know the the three months is almost up. I, I would move to accept the extension as we as as is before us. Um, what happens in future, that's a different story, but I I looked at it as well, um, but I think it's reasonable, it's due process, and we're just uh, extending it to the 21st, I think it's the 21st or something of, of this month. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I suppose just one point of clarification, given that communication has been an issue, is the applicant is asking for an extension till the end of March. So we need to be very clear, um, as per their letter attached to the report, that we are only able to extend it to the 21st of March. And my question to Jamie would be, what happens after that point? Does it, the uh, development permit get cancelled? What, what, what happens? Thank you very much um, through through the chair. The um, it's it's a good point of clarification. We can only extend it until March 21st. So that is that is um, abund abundantly clear in the extension that would be provided. And um, you know, following that, the applicant would have to come back to council for um, a whole new uh, permit and uh, and approvals following that if work does not commence. Uh, so it would be a, a whole new development permit and variance under today's bylaws. And that would include the getting of the covenant. It's not just putting a spade in the ground council's work. What actually they have to get that agreement signed by the 21st and back to the district. Yes, in, in fact, um, at least at least to the extent of like a letter of undertaking provided by a, a legal counsel proving that that will be registered on title. 
Um, the covenant sufficiently provided to the district so that we are satisfied with it. Uh, basically, the letter of undertaking from uh, legal counsel guarantees that it will be registered at some point. Um, and, and then um, not only that, but in fact, some level of works commencing or proof of substantial investment in terms of the, uh, the work actually taking place on the site uh, for it to be in place. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure of the logistics of uh, how that works for the applicant, but this is the most we can grant in terms of an extension. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I don't see this due process uh, to allow them to have a, a three month extension. Um, as I didn't, uh, I did not support this application in the first place and I still don't support it. So I will not be supporting it. Um, okay. I don't think it's the, uh, the right, the right plan for the area. It's, it's Bitsy PC tiny little development that never works out and it sterilizes the other lots. It doesn't give us the chance to actually have a decent sized <coughs> development for uh, any kind of multifamily. So I will not support it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kozen. Well, that one sounds better. I just wanted to thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say that I support Councillor Ireland. I didn't support this in off the get go either. I felt it was the wrong fit for the community, so I will not be supporting an extension. Okay, thank you. I need a, a motion for. Uh, Your Worship, uh, it, it was moved by Councillor Gamble. Well, we don't have a second. Oh, moved by Councillor Gamble. Yeah. Move this, the extension. Do we have a seconder for that? <laughs> Uh, Councillor Reed. And any further discussion? Those in favor of the extension? Councillor Gamble, Councillor Reed. Those opposed? Councillor Scarrow, Ireland, Koza, and uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, motion failed. Okay, no extension of the square. All right, next up. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. Um, I'll, I'll step out of the way here very quickly, but I do want to provide just a brief verbal introduction to uh, a new planner who has joined our team. Uh, Tamara Rogers uh, has recently joined us, was working in uh, an, another nearby local government, but we've been fortunate to have uh, Tamara join us and has been a, uh, a, a, you know, a fantastic addition to our planning team and has been coming in and asking all the right questions and uh, has been uh, an excellent uh, complement to our skill set and our approach here. But uh, with that being said, uh, I do want to pass it over to, uh, to Tamara who will present the uh, next two files uh, for our department. Thank you. Welcome Tamara. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening to everyone. I'm just going to quickly load my presentation. Great, thank you so much. So the next file um, this evening is ALR 2020-001, which is a non-adhering residential use application for temporary farm worker housing at 4340 Shanks Road. Um, and this property is obviously within the ALR. It's also zoned A1 and within the agricultural future land use designation of the official community plan. And I did want to note that this application was applied for on February 11th, 2020. And it is my understanding that the applicant, Mr. Gurgender Sander and his consultant, Mr. Carl Whitler, who is a professional agrologist, are present this evening and are available to call in if needed. As mentioned, this is 4340 Shanks Road. Um, um, as shown on the location plan here, and it is located at the boundary between Lake Country and the city of Kelowna. It is a 10 acre property. Um, it is surrounded by properties that are also within the AOLR and it is currently planted with approximately nine acres of ambrosia and honey crisp um, apple orchard planted at a high density of 3200 trees per acre. There is an existing house 
and an existing accessory dwelling on the property as well as some farm buildings. And I did also want to note um, just for some um, context of the area that there is um, a temporary farm worker housing um, small development located a few properties north of the subject property at 8090 Shanks Road. Um, that's 42 um, units, so it is comparable to what we're looking at this evening. The applicant's proposal is to construct temporary farm worker housing for 40 workers in the northeast corner of the property. And this is uh, a picture, um, I believe in the summer, of the northeast corner of the property um, adjacent to Shanks Road. So as you can see, um, there are existing trees in the location that would need to be removed to accommodate the housing. Again, um, this is showing the, the approximate location of the housing. Uh, it is proposed to be in mobile camp trailers, approximately, or, or sorry, I should say, um, a total of 937 square meters of gross floor area for 40 sleeping units, common areas, kitchen facilities, and washrooms. And it would be in the configuration um, shown here on the screen. And the agrologist did confirm that this location um, would minimize the impact to agricultural land um, as its placement does not impede farm activities and is closer to the road, so it would require less land to be impacted for things like driveways. The housing would be visible from Shanks Road and no visual buffers have been proposed. The application as proposed went to the Agricultural Advisory Committee three times. So the first um, meeting was held on June 22nd, 2020, and the AAC referred the file back to staff with direction on specific details it would like to see as part of the proposal and direction on an acceptable number of farm workers for an operation of this scale. And as a result, the applicant submitted a farm plan. The farm plan notes that all of the orchard work relies on manual labor to perform tasks, uh, describes the business model, which includes um, stem clipping of, of apples, um, as well as the fact that it is a higher density uh, planting. And it did include um, a calculation of their labor requirements. And so the farm plan notes that the uh, workers are mainly required in April for pruning, June for thinning, and September, October uh, for harvest. And the applicant does state that 40 workers are needed to harvest the best quality fruit on time. And my understanding is this number of 40 workers comes from um, 405 um, so-called man days divided by the approximate 10 days of, of harvest time, which would equal approximately 40 workers. And, and just sorry, one other thing I wanted to add for additional context is that the applicant does own 170 acres of apple and cherry orchard within the region. Um, only 10 acres of this is, is owned within Lake Country. The application returned to the AAC on October 19th. Uh, the Agriculture Advisory Committee then referred the file back to staff with the requirement of an agrologist report um, to be provided prior to reconsideration of the file. And they noted three things in particular that they wanted this agrologist report to consider. So um, the loss of farmland with respect to the proposed location of the housing, the health and safety of the farm workers to be housed in this location um, with regards to spray, drift, and then whether it is reasonable for 40, 40 farm workers to be required for this orchard. The applicant then proceeded to submit this report um, and it did speak to these things. The agrologist uh, noted that the proposed location does not impede farming activities. He listed actions to protect workers and neighboring properties from spray drift and, and noted that any or all of them would be appropriate in this context. And then he discussed that stem clipping um, and the high density fruiting wall does require more labor than traditional orchards. And I will note that we did receive a referral from the Ministry of Agriculture that also um, acknowledged that this business model probably would require more labor than traditional orchards, but neither the agrologist nor the uh, Ministry of Agriculture um, specifically said that 40 was the, the right um, number. And then the agrologist did make a recommendation, um, and this is a quote from the report. Um, it says, I would recommend that the AAC support this application for a permanent temporary farm worker housing and that the District of Lake Country approve this application with a requirement for landscaping, buffering, and the usual building permit requirements. And so 
the application returned to the AAC on January 25th. And after discussion, the AAC recommended support um, to council for this application. And they added that the AAC recommends that council amend the zoning bylaw regulations for temporary farm worker housing to better support agriculture within the region in accordance with the District of Lake Country Agriculture Plan and local best practices. And I did want to offer um, two points of clarification. Um, the first is that, um, and I think this is a function of being new to the district, uh, I did not realize that council previously had directed staff to review the zoning bylaw regulations for temporary farm worker housing. Um, and so council's resolution is included here. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to note is that originally staff had interpreted the bylaw to mean that farm workers could only work on the site on which they are housed. But on closer examination of the district zoning bylaw, staff concluded that while the buildings used for the housing must be for workers employed, workers employed on the same site as the farm operation, farm workers are not precluded from also working on other lands within the same farm unit. And for reference, I did um, discuss this with the Agricultural Land Commission staff, and they confirmed that the ALC also has the ability to consider the needs of the wider farm unit. And I did do a little bit of research, and again, this is just for reference um, for council to understand what um, local, other local governments nearby um, um, do for temporary farm worker housing on this particular issue. Um, so I just wanted to note that uh, the RDCO, City of Kelowna, and City of West Kelowna all allow um, farm workers to work on other parcels within the same farm unit. I will note that City of Kelowna and City of West Kelowna um, they further restrict that to parcels within city limits, whereas RDCO um, does not have that restriction. And again, this is just meant to be background. Um, so um, for, for council's reference. If this application were to be approved, a building permit and access permit would be required. And then um, the subdivision and development servicing bylaw would also have the following requirements, including highway and walkway improvements and a, and a few other things listed here. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Arlen, question or comment or? Yeah, I don't have any. Well, I might have some questions as, as I go along here. I've, I've, got a, I've got a number of concerns. First off, on Shanks Road, as you pointed out, there's a another um, there's another temporary farm worker housing unit just up the road um, of 40 units. But uh, just across the border in Kelowna, on Shanks Road, just up the hill to the left, there's another temporary housing for 140 workers. So that would mean that we're going to put 200 units on Shanks Road because we're going to add another 40 here. There's already 40 and there's already 140. So we're making this kind of a neighborhood. And, and, you know, I realize it's short term, but I, I've got some concerns about that. And I think the residents that live on Shanks Road have some concerns about that as well. Uh, my next concern is that I read the report and, and they talk about buffering and landscaping, but they talk about buffering and landscaping between the housing and the orchard to protect the farm workers. Well, as you drive down Shanks Road, you pass by that first set of farm worker accommodation and it looks terrible. It looks terrible. It's a bunch of old echo trailers that need to be painted that are sort of blocked off now with a, a fence that kind of is was, looks like it was built by me. It's not very straight and it's not very clean and it's not standing up all that good. So, you know, if this were to go ahead, I would I would absolutely want to have buffering on Shanks Road for the public. Uh, the, the next issue I have is that uh, the, the applicant has 10 acres in Lake Country and 100 and what? 140 other acres someplace else, right? So, and I understand as well that he also has temporary farm working worker housing in other locations as well. And, uh, you know, it's all well and fine for, uh, you know, for farms in our community to have temporary farm worker housing for the farms that are in our community. 
but I would suggest that we look into to uh, not becoming a warehouse for the temporary farm workers that work in Kelowna. They certainly won't have our farm workers live, as you pointed out, their bylaw specifies that they have to work in Kelowna and they can't be housed. If they're housed in Kelowna, they have to work in Kelowna. So that means that Lake Country could potentially, this could become a warehouse for, for workers for Kelowna or wherever else. And I don't think that's fair to the to the citizens. I certainly don't, I'm not, I'm not sure that I support it just on, based on uh, the number of temporary farm working housing units on Shanks Road. If it was in another location, I would have a, a whole lot easier time with it. Um, because I certainly don't want to prevent someone from farming, but I just don't see it in addition to this, to, to the load that's already on that community currently. So uh, at this point, I'd have to be persuaded to, to, uh, to support it. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing it. And uh, if, if it was to be supported, I'd certainly want to see some buffering between it and the road. And I think that we need to look at these kind of things because there's a number of these around the community and there's no buffering, you know, and they look terrible. You know, they look like we're, we're just allowing to put industrial stuff wherever people want to. Now, there's lots of farmers who do keep up their buildings and, and look after things, but uh, what's currently on Shanks Road doesn't look like that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Gamble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did drive along there as well, and um, I certainly don't have a problem with the other trailers that are there if, in fact, the um, the owner of that operation uh, has properties that he is operating in our community. I, I have concerns about using Lake Country property, Lake Country land, as the um, maybe low cost center for uh, worker housing. Um, and, and I'm not sure that it is, but um, you know, just looking at the, um, the proposal here and obviously they are thinking about transferring workers. They're not going to be using 40 workers for the pruning or thinning unless they're doing it in maybe a week's time or something like this. Um, it's certainly not going to take three months to prune eight and a half acres. You would be long go, you would be broke <laughs> very quickly if it took that long. And same with thinning. So, um, and, and as far as the picking, whatever, uh, it's, uh, it, it, that is uh, definitely uh, a concern. So uh, I, I, I think the thing that I feel is that we only know that this operator is running eight and a half acres in, of, of apples, planted apples in Lake Country. I know the property is a little bit larger, but um, that to me is a big concern and I don't, I don't believe I could support it um, under those circumstances. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, um, Tamara, for your Tamara, sorry, uh, for your presentation. Welcome on board. Um, I think I would echo the comments of um, my other councillors. I am concerned in that the site diagram shows no driveway or access um, to that development, um, and the indication from the owner and the agrologist is that those workers would be used substantially in the other areas of his. Um, property. So my question would be if we are considering that I would like to see some access information, um, the impact on the buffer on the uh, farmable land. I think both of those would uh, reduce the amount of land on that property. Um, and I would, I, th I suppose it would be a question to Mr. Sander is why choose Lake Country when over it only substitutes really 8% of your the entire operation. So is there a, a logistical reason for choosing um, that area um, as opposed to one of the other 160 acres that he has um, in the region? Anybody have an answer to that? I beg your pardon? Okay. We'll hear from him. Are you 
Hello. There you are. Go ahead. Yeah, see you again there. Hi, Mr. Sandha, it's Councillor Reid here. I don't know whether you had the opportunity to hear um, the question I asked, which was, um, is there a, what was the uh, reason for choosing to base the 40 uh, workers in the Lake Country property um, as opposed to the extensive uh, agricultural holdings that you have elsewhere in the region? To your knowledge, uh, we already have the worker housing in, in Kelowna area near the airport. And this is the block we need more labor. So that's why we selected this property. Okay, and, so and we are not against the bylaw and we are following the bylaw. The city of Lake Country allowed 40 workers as it been allowed to another farmers. And it's not my fault if those housing are on the same road. I think the city is back and choose those uh, consideration when uh, approving these applications. If there is bylaw, that's what I read the bylaw and if bylaw law for the workers, this is how we proceed with our uh, application. Okay, okay. If, if so, have, if, so if, if this is sitting in the city of Lake Country from more than a year, if I knew this, this is this will take so long, I may not go far for this application. OK, so can I just ask a follow up question, Mr. Santa? Um, your your um, notes say that they would be needed for approximately 10 days during the harvest season. So is the plan to use uh, the workers on your other properties for the other part of those two harvest months? We don't know for sure when we will okay. how many how many worker we get what time of the year, but for, for pruning and thinning and for the picking, we need that many workers. When, for, especially for the harvest, we have to finish this harvest in 10 to 14 days. So that, then we need all that labor. It could be right now we are using seasonal workers from foreign countries, but it could be local labor as well if it become available in the coming years. OK, thank you. OK. Uh, anybody else? Questions for the applicant? Hearing none. Councillor Scarrow, did you have a question? I have no question. I just my concern, I guess, follows along the lines of the other applicants. But I also, uh, you know, historically, and I know councils gamble with farmers in our blood and we want to see agriculture succeed. And so that word balance comes in. And uh, I, I believe that Mr. Sandu is it um, is asking for more than what he really requires. And uh, I might be more compelled to approve, you know, a, a 10 or a 15 or a 16 or something like that number uh, and see him draw from his other properties in those 10 primary days. But right now he's talking about housing 40 employees when he really only needs 40 employees for eight to 10 days out of the year. And and I'm having trouble finding my way to support that, even though agriculture is important to me. Well, I see it in the office and if um, those, uh, if our bylaw permits uh, foreign workers to work on other properties in the same farm unit, doesn't matter whether they're in uh, Kelowna or Vernon or uh, Lake Country, uh, if you own agricultural land in those areas and you need a large crew some of the time, you still need to have some place where they can stay. If the other communities say they can't, you only can work in the community that you have your farm labor buildings, then um, you wouldn't be able to locate a unit in Kelowna and have some workers come to his Lake Country farm. So it, it, a, because they say their bylaw says you have to uh, have the structure where you do the work. Ours says you can have the structure as long as it's the same uh, farming unit and you need to move your workers around to your different uh, locations. So I, I would support uh, the uh, CAO's uh, 
comments is uh, item B, but uh, Councillor Ireland. Yeah, I, I would say to that that I, it sounds to me like Kelowna is protecting their citizens more than uh, Lake Country is protecting their citizens. Let's not forget that these things are a toll on the community as well. And, you know, we, we want the community to embrace farming. And I just don't see that it's reasonable for for us, you know, and, and the applicant, you know, doesn't really care. And, and I guess he probably shouldn't that there's other farm worker, a substantial amount, just not other, but a substantial amount of other temporary housing on that same road. But, you know, he, he maybe shouldn't care because he doesn't have to care about the community. That's our job. Our mm -hmm. job is to worry about the development of the community and what goes forward. And uh, <clears throat> I don't believe that this is in the best interest of our community. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that uh, 40 workers, you know, <laughs> Okay. that are going to be working in Kelowna. I don't believe that we should become the place for housing. So, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jim, uh, Mayor Baker. Um, I'm really appreciating, James, what you had to say there about the alternative, uh, the alternative not being able to happen. And then Councillor Ireland's comments that perhaps Kelowna is protecting their citizens more than us. You could view it that way if you wanted, but um, supporting residents and balancing that with supporting agriculture mm. is dragging me over to the side of support here because uh, Shanks Road is probably where the largest proportion and the biggest block of, uh, you know, ALR land exists. Am I wrong, Penny? Uh, I, I feel that there's an awful lot of agricultural land down there and, and uh, it sure looks like it. So I know she's shaking her head, but anyway, I'm, I'm wondering if the applicant could refer to whether or not a 20 unit approval would be an asset and a compromise that we could live with, with the buffering in place. Um, can the owner of the farm comment on that? Yes, uh, we are we are following the bylaw. I think I'm. What my understanding is, city or lake country is unfair from one application to another application. This is my biggest concern. If you are making some laws by law, it should be consistent across the whole community. My feeling is that my applicant is sitting there for more than one year, and we are not building something for for free for somebody. It's it cost me money. It cost me time and money to bring these workers and provide the housing for these workers. Those time has gone when we can get local labor. Okay, thank you. Um, I have Councillor uh, McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I have mixed feelings on this one as well. I sat through the uh, advisory committee meetings on this one. Um, and uh, you know it was sent back for sure so you know I can feel um, that it has taken a little longer than it, what it uh, maybe should have um, due to that uh, going back and forth. Um, so when I look at this a uh, couple issues I have with it is um, being that it's right beside the road uh, you know I agree with my fellow councillors that there should be some sort of buffering or something along there. Um, while it would be nice to keep it to a smaller property, um, you know, keeping keeping more trees in there, um, uh, you know, I, I have find myself a little struggling with the fact that um, a lot of the workers will be not in Lake Country. Um, but the other thing that we might run into is um, we might end up with smaller camps um, on every property, which is not really what we want as well. So that's my my struggle on this one. So I, I like the fact that we ask about the smaller camp, um, but uh, that that would be my concern is we end up with a bunch of little camps all over all over Lake Country, and I'm sure nobody wants to see that as well. So I'm still um, 
Uh, I'm not 100% decided on this one yet, so uh, I'd like to hear some thoughts on that. Um, well, again, and for, who did? No, Councillor Gamble and Councillor Reed. Did you have your hand up? Okay. I know you were just. Councillor Gamble, go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and you know, I I am always there to support agriculture, but I'm also here to support the community, and um, and I do have concerns when this is a very small property. It, it's um, under 10 acres. Um, there is a large house on the property. There is another house that was used um, in the past to house uh, workers. Uh, and now we're talking about putting a, a large development, uh, well, at Co Trailers um, that would house uh, as many as 40 um, individuals. Um, I do have concerns because uh, the operator is only operating a, such a small acreage in our community, which means we are providing housing for another community. And, uh, and I do not uh, feel that that is an appropriate use of our agricultural land. Um, I, I would not have the same feeling if it were a smaller number. Um, but I understand that this is a business decision for the applicant and, uh, and they have the largest part of their farm in another community. So I think uh, as um, Councillor Ireland said, we're looking after, we're considering our community and, uh, and I think that's our responsibility. Okay, thank you. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would just um, was reading through the agrologist's report and I noted that he made a comment um, and his pictures and his report were based on a much smaller square footage, um, 530. Uh, 500 square feet um, and the current proposal with the ATCO trailers um, is coming out at just over a thousand square feet with the parking included um, and I he made the note in the report that the the, the use of the ATCO trailer was expanding the um, potential had the potential to expand the site coverage which it certainly looks like it's almost doubled that um, I just wonder um, given that we do have concerns over the size of the, the project, is there any option to go back to the original scope that was outlined in the agrologist report in terms of the accommodation? And, and this would be a, a question to Mr. Santa. Um, is there any option to use that rather than the ATCO trailers, which seem to be doubling approximately the size of the site? Okay. Okay. Yes, I will prefer to have a permanent building. I don't like that co type trailer, but that's the only option been given to us by the city. That's why we go after those trailers. They are not in. Uh, they are not inexpensive. They are expensive, as maybe seventy percent cost of building a permanent building. I will be happy to build a permanent building if we are allowed. Okay. Thank you. If you built the permanent building, would that then comply with the the size, the dimensions as per the agrologist that us, uh, Mr. Withers report? Yes. OK, would staff be able to comment on 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 that position? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just um, I'm looking at the, the zoning bylaw right now. So the zoning bylaw does require um, that this um, temporary farm worker housing not be on um, a foundation. So it has to be temporary in nature. Um, and, and so that's why we are typically seeing um, the, the ATCO trailer style temporary farm worker housing. Okay. You had a further comment, Councillor Arnold? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just in regard to Councillor Reed's comments, it's not the size, it's the number of staff, it's the number of people. It's a community of 40 people added to another community of 40 people, added to another community of 140 people, uh -huh. all living on the same road, all supporting, I think only one of them supports farms on the property that they're, that they're, uh, that they're situated on. So, um, 
the problem that you get when you create these large communities, and I, here's here's where I would differ from Councillor McKenzie, is that had this project come through with a with a with half the density, then I don't think I'd have an issue with it. And should some of these places, should we see little units pop up around the community on farms? I don't think I'd have a problem with that. The bigger problem is when you have this large density. I mean, what what you do is you create and you almost create a little mini town. And that's what affects the community. That's what causes issues for the neighbors. When you spread these people out throughout the community, then they tend to interact with the community and it's much better for everybody. So, um, you know, there's been a number, we've had a number of issues with the large community, even across the border in Kelowna. Our bylaw services have attended that place numbers of times because of issues that have cropped up there. So those kind of large encampments are really the, the problem. So I don't, I don't think that reducing the size of the property, reducing the size of the building is going to solve the problem. It's reducing the numbers I of people. Uh, hear from the applicant. Yeah, <clears throat> there, are, there are two big housing uh, on the same road, Shanks Road, as been talked. But the biggest one is, I think, if I know correctly, it's uh, more than 140 workers. Uh, it's on the Gaines property, and that property is on the same road. And it's been, I think, the location of the property is in, in Kelowna area. But I, other other housing is on the Shank Road is uh, as 40 work as you I know about other property. But I, my concern is why the city of Lake Country was not concerned when 140 units were built on the same Shanks Road and they were using the same road as Lake Country's Shanks Road. And and City of Kelowna asked again to build their road, but City of Lake Country never looked at building the road. There are large potholes on that Shanks Road. Yeah. So my concern is why the City of Lake Country was silent when those two uh, were, were, worker housing was built by Green. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gamble. Well, just just uh, to explain, I guess that we really have no jurisdiction outside of our boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, when that decision was made by the city of Kelowna, uh, we were informed, but we did not have uh, any opportunities uh, to to uh, really say yes or no. We did not have jurisdiction, and uh, in fact, um, Mr. Gein put that. Uh, development on, uh, I believe it's all outside the ALR. It is not on located on ALR land, uh, and uh, and that was deliberate so that it did not affect the uh, the farmed property. I believe it houses quite a bit more than 140 people. I'm not sure exactly how many, um, but I I don't personally, uh, from my point of view, that is not the issue. Um, it wouldn't matter to me if uh, there were three um, housing units there on Shanks Road. The issue for me is that the people will not be working for the most part in Lake Country, or at least uh, the majority of their stay uh, will. And if they're coming in pruning season, they're coming early in the season, um, probably you know March, April. And uh, and they're going to be staying until harvest, which is likely October. So it's a long period of time they're going to be there, and they won't be. It's not that they're going to be transferring in Lake Country; they're going to be transferring to another area. All right. Uh, well, my last comment, and I think we should try to get a, a motion on this, but uh, it I. I see it as benefiting agriculture, whether it's actually Lake Country's agriculture. I don't see farm, temporary farm workers as detrimental to the to the community as uh, Councilor Ireland says. And the, the, um, our bylaw says that what uh, is been applied for is permissible. I noticed 
the Agricultural Land Commission, or our advisory committee, not the Land Commission, but our Agricultural Committee, uh, went around it for three times or so, but then felt that it was worth it to agriculture. And, and I consider it worth it to agriculture. But I, I do need a, a motion one way or the other so the applicant knows where he, he is. And it's been somewhat of a year or something, I think you said, since he's been trying to get this happening. So anybody prepared to? My choice would be uh, option B. James? But, yeah. Mr. Mayor? Um, yeah. So, you know, it's Todd here again. I was just, um, you know, at at those meetings, and um, I definitely uh, want to support our our committees. And um, I know they, you know, went uh, back and forth on this one. And uh, you know, I, I I do see that that's probably uh, the way I have to side as well, because um, you know, we uh, we want to support those guys and. Um, they definitely uh, definitely talked at this one with length, so I think I'm leaning towards towards uh, approval on this one for me personally. Uh, so I will uh, motion it uh, if um, if somebody wants to second it. I have the agrologist on the phone who'd like to speak. If, who? if you would like, sir, the agrologist Carl Withler. Okay. If, yeah, well, just, if I'll, you would like to hear from him I'll or. Just, I'll hold our motion until I hear from uh, okay. the agrologist. Mr. Whiffler, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, if you make sure your volume is uh, completely off on your computer and you're now live in the council chambers. Go Thank ahead. you. Yes, good evening. Good evening. I apologize for being uh, unconnected, disconnected to the meeting, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I wanted to relate just some of the fears of quote, protecting the community. Uh, I think that the Salmon community has been committed to the District of Lake Country and City of Kelowna and the City of West Kelowna for long periods of time, built infrastructure, built roads, and otherwise. I think that um, Mr. Sander and other Orchardists are committed to the community that they live in and, and the employees that they bring in from Mexico and the Caribbean are there for one purpose, and that is to assist the farming community of British Columbia and Canada generally in everything from planting, picking, growing, and harvesting all points in between. They're not in this to your community. They want to live on their farms. They want to work on their farms. They want to send money back to their families in the country from which they came. There is regularly concern as these workers come into new locations, but as time passes, people find pretty quickly there is no risk to the community. Mm -hmm. So that should not be much of a concern uh, for our council. Okay, thank you. Oh. If I may add as well. And I promise I'll be quiet after this. Okay. That temporary farm worker housing is an expensive proposition wherever it's located. And I don't think that Mr. Sandra or others who are sitting around the council table want to waste their money along the way. Mr. Sandra, in my opinion, has done a very good job of balancing his need for labor with the expenditure uh, required for housing. Well, thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate You're your. Welcome. Uh, Carl, uh, maybe you could speak again. I'm sorry, but you're very close to the mic, maybe, and we're really having trouble understanding your words. Well, sorry about that. Does this help? Oh, well, I can hear you plainly, but um, apparently the ones that uh, aren't mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. can't. Can mm -hmm. you hear, Councilor Gamble? Hi. I haven't been able to hear anything. It's not understandable. It's just, it sounds garbled, and I know Carl is not garbled. Is that our tech guy's fault? No, it's likely my fault, and I apologize for this. I should have come on the team's earlier. I assumed it was on a regular team's meeting. Oh, it, you got it now, uh, Councilor Gamble? 
Are you teams or? Uh... No, it's it's coming through really garbled. I've never we've never had that happen. I don't think, but uh, no, I can't understand. And I think Todd's the same and same with Kara. For some reason, it's not working for us. Is he on Teams or Zoom? Hey. Oh. I'm not. I'm working on Teams, but I'm speaking to a cell phone. Oh. Did you turn off Paco Gabba? Why is your brain? What am I doing here? Willing? Oh. He can, but would take time because he has to follow the directions on how to log in to get yeah, into the live meeting. Yeah, it would take a few minutes. Raina Ray, uh, Seabrook suggests maybe in, someone in council chambers can try and repeat or summarize what he has said. Mm -hmm. Well, Councilor Gamble, you hearing me? They're growing. No. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. I can yeah. hear everybody else. This is, I haven't really noticed this before, and I think it's the same, uh, you know, uh, Kara and Todd and even uh, Cassidy, who's uh, um, our student uh, counselor, is everyone's finding that it's it's just not intelligible. That's too bad. Um, the urologist was commenting that uh, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. And we tech guy is going to have a look at. If you could uh, comment and I'll um, repeat your words through my microphone and then uh, the ones that are on line can hear me, but not you. But uh, it's certainly uh, the point were that the uh, farm workers are essential to agriculture in the Okanagan these days and uh, necessary and that uh, beneficial and and not a detriment to the community. Can you hear me, Council Gamble? Of course, and and I don't think anybody, or at least I certainly hope they didn't say, that the foreign worker program is a problem that you know they're they're great people uh, and um, i certainly support that program 100 percent, 150 percent it's yeah. an excellent program and and we're not i don't think that this decision has anything to do with that okay well um i had councillor mckenzie uh move um uh, Option B, which was support uh, for that, but with uh, with um, uh, considerations, um, but Councillor Campbell or Councillor Scarl, uh, just state your amendment and we'll see whether it goes. Councillor McKenzie, um, in option B, it suggests that buffering happens between the buildings and the farm and it doesn't recommend any buffering for the street or, or the side yards would you in your motion accept an amendment that includes street side buffering uh yes i would actually that's uh, in my original comments that's what uh, i would like to see actually okay and then um, the, second, the second question is would you accept an amendment as to the amount of units to 20 or 30? No, I can't. Uh, 40. That's what they're going on. I'm, 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 uh, the more I think about it, I'm a little more concerned that it's going to end up with, with, uh, it spread out. Um, and, and as much as, um, that might be good sometimes, uh, in this, in this case, uh, I, I have to side with the Agriculture Advisory Committee um, and their recommendation because uh, they put a lot of work into this and um, you know that's the reason why we have those committees. Okay, and James Mayor Baker has uh, just made me aware that our bylaw allows that. We couldn't really reduce it anyway. So I will second your amended motion. 
Okay. And you're all right with that? Uh, you're the mover, Councilor McKenzie. I am, thanks. Okay. And Councilor Reed? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wonder, I would be happy to support this motion, but I still do have a question over the access to the property. Is maybe the applicant would be able to clarify, is the access going to cause any more loss of agricultural land or will it, is it included in the current parking area and coming straight out onto the road? Uh, hmm. The applicant there? I don't know. It would come straight out onto the road. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Some pre workers don't have vehicles most of the time. No, my my question was around the transportation of the farm workers to other sites. So I just wanted to make sure if there was a, a bus or some sort of coach pulling up that we didn't lose any more fruit trees to the access route. That was fine. No. You will not lose any more fruit trees, no. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Well, Got a motion. Um, any more discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'll take the question. Option B with uh, buffers. Those in favor? Uh, those opposed? Councillor Gamble, uh, Ireland, and Kozeb. Uh, motion carried. Thank you. And, uh, all right. On to good job on the presentation to Tamara. Oh yeah, good job, Tamara. Excellent job, Is thank you. Tamara or Tamara? Tamara. 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 Right. Thank you. Good job. All right. Okay, next one up. Your Worship, this is again uh, Tamara. She's gonna talk about the regional growth strategy, five year review. Okay. You're up, Tamara. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your patience while I load this. All right, so the next file is a referral from the Regional District of Central Okanagan, R2021-001. And the RDCO is requesting that council provide comments and express an opinion regarding whether there is a need for a review of the RGS at this time. Input received will be provided to the Regional Board prior to deciding whether to undertake a five-year review. Just some quick background, the Regional Growth Strategy, Our Home, Our Future, was adopted by the RDCO in 2014. And the Regional District has a statutory obligation under the Local Government Act to consider at least once every five years whether the RGS should be reviewed for possible amendment. And the Regional, regional District must provide an opportunity for input, input on whether the RGS should be reviewed. Here's just a, a brief timeline. So again, the Regional Board adopted the RGS in 2014. In 2017, the RGS Priority Projects Plan was endorsed by the Regional Board, and the RGS Priority Projects Plan contains a five-year action plan that outlines priority initiatives for the RDCO to implement based on commitments defined in the RGS. The, um, and I would like to note that the RGS Priority Projects Plan was the resort, uh, sorry, the result of a collaborative process between the RDCO, the RGS Steering Committee, uh, the member municipalities, and other uh, many other agencies. And so, so um, that five-year action plan spans from 2017 to 2021. So uh, since then, um, projects have been um, ongoing. The implementation of the RGS um, is, is occurring. And 2019 marks the five years since the RGS was adopted. Yeah. Yeah. And the, oh, go ahead. The, oh. <laughs> the RDCO um, kindly provided this uh, um, RGS Priority Projects Plan status update um, and just um, it, it outlines the nine priority projects plan um, pro priority projects 
um, shows the ones that have been completed, like the regional housing needs assessment, um, the regional flood management plan um, phase two is complete, um, those that are ongoing, like the regional planning lab, um, and, and those that are slated for 2021 or are, are still to be determined. And after the conclusion of this current action plan, um, which um, it has been delayed in, in part due to the pandemic, it is anticipated that a new work plan will be developed, which would provide another opportunity within the existing RGS framework for the regional district and member municipalities to collaborate again and identify new opportunities um, or priorities. Um, and it should be noted that there's um, these were just nine um, priorities identified out of uh, many that were um, um, listed in the RGS priority projects plan. So there's still a lot of work that could be done within the existing RGS. And just a few considerations um, before the end of the presentation, an RGS review um, is a multi-year initiative uh, which would require funding and staff resources and staff um, that currently do not have the capacity to take on such a project and there is no, um, no allocated funding at this time. Another point I wanted to make is that an RGS review would require comprehensive public engagement um, and considering the OCP is relatively new, uh, the agriculture plan was recently adopted. Um, it is possible uh, if um, the um, regional district were to undertake an RGS review that um, citizens could experience some consultation fatigue. Uh, again, as I mentioned, there's flexibility within the existing RGS implementation framework to address new or changing priorities when the new um, priority projects um, plan five year um, action plan is, is um, completed. Again, there's work left to complete within the existing RGS and if council um, considers that now is not the right time to review the RGS for possible amendment, um, I wanted to remind council that there would be an opportunity again in the next um, five years because of the regional district statutory obligation. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Scarrow. Move option A, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Aaron, second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Both. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll revisit in five years. We've got lots to do our own. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Look, it's Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see my slides now, though? Uh, yes. Perfect. That's excellent. Beginner's luck. OK, thank you. Um, we're going to work through a pretty complex application. I provide a little bit of clarification um, in response to a question before uh, council this evening. Hopefully that clarifies it. And hopefully as we walk through the uh, process here, through the, the chronological steps, if you will, um, everything will become more clear. Um, this is is by far a, a, a very complicated um, set of circumstances, so I will endeavor to try to stick to my script and keep it as simple as possible. So our intention with this official community plan amendment and this zoning amendment is to uh, resolve a number of outstanding issues, allow the property owner to complete a subdivision in accordance with a historical ALR exclusion approval, and to rely, uh, realign the OCP and the zoning map boundaries to reflect existing uses and a, a contemplated boundary adjustment subdivision to respect um, those uses. The property owner contends also that the official community plan, when it was adopted, um, designated uh, the property on the future land use plan uh, in a way that was inconsistent with uh, a previous designation. So um, there were land uses in existence on the property um, that uh, likely resulted in the designations being applied as they were, but it, it didn't take into account that, those historical references, which we'll, we'll review so that you can have a look to see if, if it is appropriate to amend them. So the proposed designation amendments um, are being recommended to correct the, this inconsistency um, with historical uses, 
existing servicing constraints um, to respect future development potential in, in light of those servicing constraints. And so the proposed draft bylaws also account for the Agricultural Land Commission approval, as I said, to for exclusion of a 1.2 hectare portion of the site. And uh, researching that was a big part of sort of unraveling the story. OK, apparently I have to do this with my mouse, so bear with me. All righty, so did it advance? There we are. All right, so the parent property here is uh, 9.75 hectares in size, about 24 acres. The area of concern um, at the southern portion there is really about two hectares, just under five acres. Um, of particular concern, I'm, I'm pointing out on uh, the inset here. Um, you can see the green is the ALR designation, and uh, unfortunately, the, it also shows up as green on the, the beach portion. So that's Oyama Station Beach, and that is of significant concern um, to getting that piece sorted out, you'll notice on our GIS mapping, it doesn't actually show as part of the parent property, but it is in fact, that's just a, an anomaly in, in, in the mapping after all the road dedications and whatnot. So we've, we've clarified that. This is the plan that you were shown a couple of years ago when you first saw it. Uh, unfortunately, at the same time as, as you're considering adoption of the official community plan, this bylaw or this package of bylaws came forward to you and it was actually based on mapping that wasn't um, consistent with the, the maps that were eventually adopted. So this is where I was trying to make that clarification. So this is not the map that we'll be proceeding with, but I wanted you to see what the differences were between where we started and where we're getting to. Good news is, based on the adoption of the new, on, on the new official community plan, it, the process is actually a bit simplified, so it's not too bad. So in July 2nd, 2019, um, when Council granted the first reading to the bylaw, this made sense, but it doesn't any longer, so we need to update it. So our concern is what are the future plans for the area identified as Area E, um, where there's the encroachment of the boat storage from the adjacent property? And the second thing is the um, confirmation that the applicant is aware of the requested rezoning of the area C from C2 to C9 would result in a gas bar not being permitted. So that's what council wanted clarified at that point. So it, it essentially got first reading, but we were sent away to, to work on those things. So as I mentioned, the zone boundaries needed to be adjusted. So we got that sorted out and uh, then we set out to uh, do the research on those other questions of which the uh, applicant was able to provide um, some clarification but we also uncovered this historical situation so now i'm going to run through hopefully fairly quickly uh, the chronology um, just to to sort of demonstrate how we got to where we are so in 1981 um, Somewhere around March 9th, um, the zoning bylaw 176 uh, designated a portion of the property as C5 motel and campground zone with a notation that it's in the ALR and that the remainder was to be RUALR or RUAG, depending upon the reference. Um, there seemed to be a couple of different uh, references made to the, um, that zone through time. 1984, there was an ALR resolution 941, which approved the exclusion of a 1.2 hectare C5 portion of the property. So uh, you can see in the inset here, um, the, sh the green shaded portion is approximately equal to that area that's identified on the ALR map in red hash marks. And in fact, um, I was able to locate a uh, subdivision plan in our uh, historical records that it appears to be the plan of subdivision that was coincidentally around 1987 submitted to the provincial approving authority um, for consideration. It was just never completed. So um, I was able to take this 
drawing and identify very specifically in our GIS system then um, the appropriate area to be rezoned um, to meet the minimum lot size and to reflect the Agricultural Land Commission's resolution. So in 2004, June actually, uh, bylaw 486 confirmed uh, the C5 motel and campground zone and uh, the remainder of the par parcel being agriculture zone. And then in 2009, around April 7th, uh, there was the adoption of the zoning bylaw 561 2007. That bylaw split zone the property, that portion adjacent to Oyama Road then was designated C2 neighborhood commercial. It's not clear to us why it changed from C5, which would be equivalent now to our tourist commercial, um, to C2, but it's likely because of the uses that existed there. The remainder, of course, became A1 because that was the new, the new name to that same agricultural zone. On April 2013, zoning amending bylaw 845 changed the zoning of that portion of the property that was A1 to A1TA to support the seasonal campground use. So that seemed to be a bit of a nod to this concept that the C5 motel and campground use came before. Um, and it was very specifically um, intended to address, I believe, um, oddly enough, perhaps farm worker housing and some of that, that seasonal use that was there. In, uh, let's see, December 2019, uh, an application was submitted uh, to resolve a, a bunch of uh, issues um, of which one would be the public use of of that portion of the Oyama Station Beach, which is actually private property. So we have a number of things going on. You can see um, I've outlined the subject area. The area in pink is essentially um, the area that is designated or should be designated tourist commercial. You can see the zoning on, on, on the other side there. So something else that we have to take into consideration is that in order to accomplish this change to the OCP designation and this, and this zoning designation change, we have to amend the urban containment area boundary. So we have that nodal area of Oyama identified as part of the uh, urban containment area. You'll notice that there is a very unusually shaped portion uh, adjacent to the boat storage where there's boat storage that's spilling over. That's one of the issues that we're trying to resolve. And then that portion um, it, that you'll note I've indicated is area of reduction. And in fact, I, I'm not proposing that we remove it from um, the urban containment area for simplicity's sake, but you should be aware that that portion will be zoned agriculture. So that's something that we'll have to tackle in, in the future. So uh, the parcel of land to the east, so that's 15970 Oyama Road, is expected to be consolidated with the land already located within the urban containment boundary. That's odd shaped piece. To create consistency with the OCP designations necessary to amend the boundary, the OCP requires submission of supporting information under section 452D when such changes are proposed. As the proposed official community plan amendment is to align the official community plan designation and further zoning with the current uses, does not facilitate future development, we're recommending to council that you waive the requirements to submit the information under 452D 1 through 12, which of course would require preparation of various uh, structure plan for this uh, small area and uh, the adjustment that's being made. Uh, it doesn't uh, seem reasonable and that is consistent with uh, what was presented to you the very first time you, you saw it. So that part has not changed. So in January 2021, um, staff confirmed a statutory right-of-way agreement uh, for public use of the beach south of Oyama, Oyama Road. As I said, o Oyama Station Beach, as I understand it. The OCP zoning and development variance permit application for relief from the servicing requirements of the subdivision and development servicing bylaw have been reviewed and this comprehensive package is prepared for you as a result of all of that. 
Um, one of the things that came out of the referral comments was that uh, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development had identified an environmentally sensitive area, which of, of course we knew it was uh, within our development permit area. They required the uh, property owner to complete an environmental assessment and I can report to you that uh, that environmental assessment prepared by Associated Environmental Consultants um, provided the additional information that was required to identify that that marsh area that you can see um, here outlined in sort of a, a light green polygon and here with the you know the marshy um, area here that area will be respected um, it won't be encroached onto um, by the proposed uh, boundary adjustment uh, when when that part of the process proceeds. So that area here on area B is basically respecting that that boundary of that environmentally uh, sensitive marsh area that um, we seek to protect. So here we, um, right, so on September 3rd, 2019, um, the applicant's response to Council's request for information was formalized. Uh, area E, as I have mentioned, is going to be made available to the Tween Lake Resort for the purpose of being, um, once, once we get through all this process, we'll be able to uh, uh, be in a position to entertain a boundary adjustment subdivision to, to rectify that problem. Um, and the applicant uh, also then at the time uh, requested that the, result, the zoning be returned to tourist commercial, including gasoline sales. So this is, um, this is to reflect those historical uses. Uh, you'll notice in uh, my report, and I didn't go into it in my presentation this evening, but there was historically uh, gas station use in this area. And um, apparently there has been um, a desire to um, have that potential for the future um, with respect to both the store and the fact that there's a lot of um, uh, boat traffic and marine gas sales might uh, be something that wants to be uh, wanted to be considered in the future. So in October, um, Matt Vader and I met with uh, Mr. Bailey uh, to review all of the, the details of the situation and assess what our next steps were. And uh, as I say, at that time, Mr. Bailey expressed that he really wanted to have uh, a site specific provision to allow for gasoline and marine fuel sales in addition to um, the existing retail sales um, that are currently there in the form of the store. So what we're proposing through the official community plan amendment then is to amend map one, the future land use plan, um, to change area A from, from tourist commercial to agriculture, area B from agriculture to tourist commercial. So we're essentially exchanging those things. And then to amend the urban containment boundary to include area B so that we make way for that boundary adjustment subdivision in due course. So you'll see that the portion south of area A is approximately equal to that 1.2 hectare portion excluded from the agricultural land reserve. So the zoning bylaw amendment is to take area A from C2 neighborhood commercial to A1TA so that will be consistent with the remainder of that property. This includes the area that is currently planted in orchard and is coincident with the boundary of the existing orchard. Area B, as I just mentioned, is that 1.2 hectare portion. It's going from C2 neighborhood commercial to C9 tourist commercial and reflects that ALR exclusion. Area C is going from RR3 rural residential to C9 tourist commercial in recognition of the fact that it is a public beach area. Area D is being proposed to go from A1TA, which is agriculture one with tourist accommodation to C9 tourist commercial because there's currently boat storage occurring there. And uh, that again would assist with the boundary adjustment. So area B then in order to reflect this desire to be able to have um, uh, gas 
and marine fuel sales needs to be subject to a site specific uh, zone amendment. So we also propose for area B to amend the tourist commercial zone to allow retail stores uh, convenience um, as well as the secondary use of gas bar and marine fuel facility. So there are um, some options laid out and of course unfortunately they're not quite as straightforward but it's essentially option A advances the amended OCP and zoning bylaws um, creating consistency between those the OCP and the zoning changes uh, the classifications to reflect those existing uses, introduces the new site specific text amendment for the C9 zone, requires qualificate uh, consolidation, pardon me, uh, of that portion of the property east of the rail trail currently used for boat storage with the adjacent property in due course, waives the development approval information requirements of the OCP section 452 and 2211 with respect to an area structure plan, and allows the creation of a lot that meets the minimum lot size of the zone, which is one hectare, and facilitates the completion of the ALR exclusion process. Option B would be the same, except that it removes any reference to the consolidation of that portion of land currently being used for boat storage with the adjacent property. Completion of that boundary adjustment subdivision would be at the discretion of the property owners. So in A, we would be requiring it. Um, in B, we would leave it to um, the applicant's discretion um, to be negotiated in the future. Option C is that we deny these requests and that we close the file. Obviously, this would mean that the agricultural uh, land reserve exclusion will, would remain outstanding and as such, the land would continue to be within the agricultural land reserve. So we'd continue to have that inconsistency between the zoning and that designation. So undoubtedly, we'll end up back here having another discussion at some point in the future. However, um, I leave it here for now. I'll try to answer any questions that you have and um, we'll ask you to make a decision. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, uh, good to get good that to get all that sorted out. Sort of. This may be the last time we need to go around. I have uh, uh, Sorry, Mr. Mayor, did you say me? You, you're getting, I'm getting double feedback from you. Oh, no, yes, it was, you're up, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thanks, Corey, for that presentation. Very thorough. Um, this this obviously has been um, um, back and forth as well. Uh, we've dealt a lot with this. Um, uh, big kudos to Matt Vader uh, for being involved in this one as well, and um, um, Mr. Bailey has been. Uh, very kind to let us use that beach for public use for many years and um, you, you know I think this all makes sense these changes uh, like I say lots of moving parts but this all makes sense and uh, the whole community benefits from this so um, I'm in full support and I will uh, motion to uh, do option A. Uh, Councillor Scarrow second, Councillor Ireland you had uh, some yeah, just a question. Um, just before I do that, I, I I do agree, and I do thank everybody for getting a lot of a lot of the uh, work done to get this and uh, and engaging Mr. Bailey. And I think uh, we're going to the right sport. And I do agree that we have to thank him for allowing people to use that beach and and making it so that it, that can continue into the future. That's a tremendous asset for the uh, the community. But my question is. I mean, I, I support getting this done. It's not quite understanding why there's an option B and how that benefits and who that benefits. It, like, I, I think that, you know, the way I, I'm looking at it, I want this to benefit Mr. Bailey because he's he's doing the right thing and he's he's uh, he's benefited us. So uh, I'd just like to understand the difference there. Okay. okay. Uh, can you answer that? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through the chair, 
option B, I actually think is probably more beneficial to both property owners. Cause if we require a subdivision to be amalgamated with another property, I think we could be doing an injustice to a negotiation of two property owners. Um, so that's why option B actually probably would be preferable on that is recognizing the land use, but I think it would be detrimental as it would be to any two parties to say, you must sell this before this goes forward um, or part of this. So option B provides the opportunity for them to do it, but not put in the position that uh, it is required. Yeah, that's that's what I, I that, that's that's what was occurring to me in the back of my mind. So, and uh, then it would certainly strike me that that would be the most beneficial to all really. Yes, I would agree. And I would say the property owner has made that known as well, not to put him in a position where he is forced to negotiate to have this, uh, but it provides them the opportunity um, to do it, not put in a position. Yeah, I mean, a good deal is a deal that where everybody comes out a winner, if that's possible. Yes, and I would say option B meets so, that uh, intent the most. I won't support the amendment for option A. <laughs> I'll be, uh, Did I'll you say remove uh, that. option B is more beneficial? I would say overall, yes. The, we want to provide council all the opportunity for that, but in terms of of negotiation, especially with property, especially recognizing um, the value of what property is. I wouldn't want to put either of the property owners in a position where they're required to have a rezoning, especially since the ALC exclusion has been since 1984. Um, I'd say that we want to deal with the farm um, a component and rezoning then having the farm and not have that held up by a property negotiation. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the answer I was looking for. Okay, uh, Councilor Scott. Thanks very much, Corey. Um, um, I got lost somewhere in your presentation and, and I need you to identify for me the, the wetlands that we're protecting and where they are. Um, they are north of that area that is being, we're sort of northwest of that area that is currently being used by boat, for boat storage. <coughs> so I think that probably the, the, the natural environment has li limited the area used for boat storage just because it would be, you know, it's marsh, so it wouldn't be a suitable place to put boats. So it, it, it sort of creates its own natural boundary, if you will. Um, but that's, that's the intent there. So what would the uh, zoning of that area be? Uh, C9. Or no. pardon me, A A one T A. It would remain A one T A. It's part of the uh, remainder parcel. Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. Carl. You're most welcome. Uh, Councilor Gamble. Um. Well, I'll just speak in favor of this. I think there's been a lot of work uh, gone into it, and I'm pleased to see it come to us. Um. I just want to clarify that uh, beach beach lot that uh, is being created. Uh, will that go to the district or what? what's the, so that's going to be a private beach. Okay. Um, Thank you again. Uh, actually, so it's not creation of a lot for some reason within the GIS with the road dedication with the province and everything. It just was not identified. It is part of the current title. What we're going to work on it is under private ownership, but it's a stat right of way where public access and we'll um, have public opportunity to use that beach as it is now. So it won't be under district ownership, but it'll be under public use within a statutory right of way where we maintain it as a public area, but not, you know, be perfectly honest, not have to buy it. <laughs> um, uh, so we've well, been working with the property owner um, and I give him a lot of credit. I've seen documents back to 1970s where the community club held uh, swimming lessons there. So we're talking, you know, 50 years of public use and I would hesitate to say that this would be a challenge because on private property, the benefit of this becoming public use is also that the RCMP and our bylaw can actually enforce there as they would in a public area because he's challenged there and he's he's putting himself at risk on a liability function if people do dumb things on private property. Uh, this allows him to be protected as well as the public to continue to use this. So I didn't hear the statutory right away. That's wonderful. That's a great solution. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I have a call to read. Oh, I think Councilor McKenzie was before me. Oh, um, I didn't see Councilor McKenzie, but I have Councilor Reed right now. <laughs> thank no? you, Mr. Thank Mayor. Thank you, Todd. Um, and thanks to the staff on their work on this. Um, the one thing I have a question on is the use of the gas station. Um, I, um, I'm happy with the retail store, but the gas station, authorizing it as intended use um, without a full public hearing 
on this um, so close to the marine life. I mean, we're protecting a marshland, but we seem to be happy to have gas storage tanks within very close proximity to Cow Lake and Wood Lake. So I just would like some more information on that process because that is one thing I'm just not sure we should be doing now. I can ahead. speak to that. I can. Um, of course, we will have to go through the standard public hearing process um, for all three of these bylaws. Um, we sh this is simply getting through second reading a public hearing. As soon as we're able to hold a public hearing, we'll be able to proceed to do that. Um, with respect to uh, the gas sales itself, I can say I found a plan from 1949. It indicated that there was something there. And so certainly I can see that there was historically something there. If for some reason there was uh, some environmental limitation on on that use, um, particularly from a provincial perspective with respect to riparian areas, that kind of thing, or all those kind of regulations that come into to play when you're talking about gas facilities, um, obviously they would apply. This does not override that. So okay. we're just, just opening the possibility for it. it is a secondary use. It's just it's a very complex file and yeah. trying to discuss everything else plus the intended use plus the future use I think is loading things a little bit too heavily in terms of what we are asking to have the public hearing on and therefore it might get lost in the rest of the details. So I would my my personal opinion is that I, I think it certainly merits discussion and great that it's going to have a public hearing, but I feel it needs to be a separate outside of this process. It's not something that's going to happen now, and I think it's too complex to kind of bury this in there kind of thing. Yeah, okay. okay. You Sorry, Corey, just for a point of clarification here is that the current zoning under C2 allows for a gas bar as is. This is recognizing the um, going back to the C5, which allowed the mm. campground component that he currently is used. So C2 is, is the current zoning, which does allow a gas bar today. What we're trying to do is recognize those uses that have historically been there as well. So regardless of what this does, it, it is already a use on the property. Right. Just for clarification, of, this is not adding it to it. It's already there. Right. Thank you. Um, Councilor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thanks, Mr. Vader. Um, yeah, um, Councillor Reed, that's what I was going to say. It's already there and that's the uh, intent of this is not to to take that away from. Um, and as well, um, we do have a gas bar just on the other side of this at Tween Lakes that is right over the water. So it's uh, it is an area that um, I fully understand your concern and um, can appreciate it because that's our drinking water. Um, including my house that's uh, straight off there. So I, I can appreciate that. Um, but that it is already there currently. So, um, you know, we definitely didn't want to uh, make changes, um, taking something away that he already had. Um, so uh, I am in agreement uh, that uh, it is going to be option B is better. I think I put the motion forward. I don't know if it's seconded, but. Uh, um, if we have to vote on that one, um, um, I would like to uh, get that change to option B. Um, so, yeah. not sure, did somebody second that one or not? Yeah, it was seconded. Uh, so, we should vote on it then and, uh, and then. Um, sure. Um, Turn, it's I best to turn that one down and then go with option B, right? Correct, correct, because it's already been moved in second and so it's now on, on the table. So okay. you need uh, to defeat option A uh, motion and then uh, have another motion on uh, uh, approving option B and vote on that. Okay. Okay. Sounds um, good. Before we go to another motion, the, the Councillor Ireland, well, you had some more. Points. No, no, that's okay. I, I was just, I just wanted to make sure that we were voting on the right option and um, that uh, 
we turned down option A if we had to do that and, and reintroduce option B. So okay. And then I might I might remind Councilor Reed and things. I mean, I there's there's lots of floating gas bars. Not that that's great, but uh, they are permitted. Uh, they're they're everywhere, and the one at Tween Lakes is uh, only meters from our water intake. It uh, has to meet environmental. Um, I want to. Take a motion on area A. Yeah, I'm. I'm just sorry. Oh, um, I just wanted to ask before we go to this motion, uh, a, a question regarding the uh, sewer. Um, how um, is the sewer dealt with on this property? I, I hate to bring it up, but we are talking about uh, property right on the lake. And I am not aware of how the sewer is dealt with there. Um, is it pumped daily, weekly? What happens? Because um, I'm sure the water table is very high. It could be a septic. Field. It'll be a septic. Um, type it'll, three. It'll be type three. I think I'm asking uh, Corey Gain. I, I oh. see Mr. Vader at the podium. Perhaps okay. he knows the answer. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, to the chair. Uh, currently, so the existing use of the store house is on a septic field. Uh, any future development would have to look at the S subdivision development servicing bylaw at that time, but this is an existing use uh, for that. There's no proposed under the zoning uh, any change of use, so the existing there uh, is a septic field for that property. And where is that septic field? <laughs> uh, it's 24 acres, so I would have to ask the uh, orchardist where it is, but I would assume it's uh, on the back side of the store, you wouldn't go too far away. Oh, oh, but I'm not talking about their their house and so on. I'm talking oh. about the portion that we're adding to Tween Lakes. You're not. The, so, there isn't structures on that, so there would be no uh, sewer requirement on that. If, oh, so if, those trailers aren't on that property? No, they are not. They are on the oh, okay. part already uh, completely separate. That clarifies that. Thank oh. you. Okay, area A is not the preferred option, but there is a motion for area option, uh, option A. Those in favor? Uh, can you read it, please? Those opposed? It's it's uh, option A, your worship. I, and, it's and, not on the list. And uh, it's been defeated because may, uh, most, most of councils were opposed. It I would appreciate it if you could read these things out. It's very difficult when uh, we don't have, you know, two screens. Read it. Yeah, I'll let staff. So we need a motion for option B then. I need a motion for option B. I'll motion it. And those in favor? Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, you got it done. Uh, Councillor Gimbo. Good, good job to all, all the staff involved in cleaning that up. No more omnibills, okay, Corey? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> well, Corey, you did a great job of making it very clear, so thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, you're up. What, what, what do you want? Your Worship, the next item is the Mulberry Local Service Area Servicing Strategy, and uh, I believe Kyle uh, uh, Wilkie is going to uh, make the presentation. Thanks, Alberto. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and give a presentation here. Can everyone see my presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Moberly Local Service Area Servicing Strategy. The purpose of this agenda item is to review an updated servicing strategy and funding options. I think it's important to discuss the background of the Moberly Local Service Area in a public meeting here. So. The Moberly Water Society first approached the district in over a about over a decade ago uh, to take over their water society. 
The district started a review of the servicing options after acquisition of the Lake Pine Water Utility, or the Lake Pine Water Utility wanted to get out of the way first. A servicing concept for the Moberly Water Society and five lots north of the society was developed in December 2015. In 2017, the properties were successfully petitioned with a $645,000 water servicing strategy and to create a local service area. The strategy was to expand the Lake Pine water system. In November of 2017, Council adopted the Moberly Local Service Area Establishment Bylaw and also the loan authorization mobility bylaw which essentially gives staff authorization to proceed with implementing the servicing strategy i think council is quite aware of this diagram the original servicing plan uh, has servicing the properties through backyard events which would require statutory right-of-way agreements with the property owners to run a water main on the rear side of their properties or and the way that they currently access and also and that was on both sides as council is aware we had a number of difficulties establishing these statutory right-of-ways so as of 2020 staff was un unable to secure the statutory right-of-way agreements to complete the work as per the servicing strategy furthermore and this is an important one the cost of the existing servicing strategy no longer reflects the current market conditions and that what that's very important when you start to look at the community charter around petitions and that you can't uh, exceed the cost and look to recoup it from that was on the petition and look to recoup it from that group. So on December the 8th, staff met with council to discuss these issues and the following resolution was adopted by council that the mobile local service area strategy be abandoned and the applicable bylaws repealed and that staff create a new servicing strategy where the applicable properties on the mobile local service area property where the applicable properties applicable mobile service area properties supply water from beaver lake water system and that information be declassified and confidential of course we were talking land matters at the time so this was in an in-camera meeting on december the 8th one thing that I've noted in the report to Council is that lots three and four are part of the Lake Pine water system. There has been a statutory right of way secured to the east of those properties that we look to service those properties from the Lake Pine water system as they are already part of the Lake Pine water system and would remove them from the Moberly water system. Lots one and two I want to bring to Council's attention are requesting to not be serviced as part of the Moberly uh, Lake uh, Moberly local service area and to be serviced in a similar manner as to lots three and four. So when we're creating these servicing strategies, the guiding policy that we use is the water restructure policy. And essentially is a policy that provides guidance in the takeover or acquisition of private water utilities. It uh, stipulates that the District of Lake Country water regulations and rates bylaw applies, which in turn essentially stipulates the subdivision development servicing bylaws to be followed. Uh, and essentially, so when we're talking laying new water mains, we follow the design guidelines laid out in our subdivision servicing bylaw. So the revised servicing strategy essentially looks at in order to service the properties identified in the mobile local service area, mm -hmm. looks at uh, approximately 600 kilometer or 600 meters of new water main on the uh, north end here, and then also upgrades approximately upsizing one and a half kilometers of water main in order to achieve fire flow out at the end of the uh, mobile local service area. So it's a total about uh, two kilometers of water main improvements at a cost of $1.78 million. We still are in the process of refining this cost number, just so Council is aware, and look going into a little bit more detail on that cost estimate. Two district strategic initiatives in that uh, area of town we should, the Council should be aware of, is our small diameter of water mains, essentially is a program to looking to upsize the water mains out in that area, is four inch pipe, and we need to upsize that in order to achieve adequate fire protection in that area along Cars Landing Road. And then also the Cars Landing water improvements that ties straight to the Cars Landing servicing strategy where staff is looking to abandon the Lake Pine uh, pump house and connect the Lake Pine water system to the Beaver Lake source 
both of which require upsizing of the water mains that are consistent with the upsizing required to service the Moberly local service area. So with that, there's option one that's presented in council is where Mo for Moberly local service area to pay for all required upgrades is to a tune of $1.78 million. Given that we have known deficiencies in that area and it probably makes sense that it fits in line with some district initiatives out there. There is the option presented also that Moby Locus Service Area pays for all required upgrades that front their properties to a tune of $1,037,000. And the district pays the required improvement south of the Moby Local Service Area, approximately $743,000. And then there was another option presented in the report to council, basically being all new water mains the Mowry Local Service Area would be responsible for all water mains that front their properties here in blue. We would share in cost of that improvement, split the cost for upsizing the water mains that front there, and the district would be responsible for the improvement south of the uh, Mowry Local Service Area. So the resolutions in the report to Council were are quite large, but I'll summarize it. Option A is the servicing strategy option one where Mowry local service area fronts it pays for it all. Option B basically is adopting the servicing strategy and the portion that fronts their property they pay for and the portion of the south of the required upgrades the district pays for. And then option C is basically the three different options where the new infrastructure, the Mowry local service area pays for, the part that fronts the, Mowry, the service area, uh, is shared between them and the district and the portion to the south the district pays for those improvements. With that I'll turn it back to council for comments and questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, comments uh, trial considerably. When we looked at this earlier and I talked about the expanding the water along Cars Landing Road uh, I, I'm certainly familiar with that area. Um, uh, full disclosure, I'm a user of uh, Lake Pine Utility and uh, provided a statutory right of way to service the lots to the west of uh, our property. I, I agreed on that easement. I thought the issue was to simply get water a better source of water than the Moberly pump from the Lake Pine pump and include all of that uh, easement area on uh, on the Lake Pine water and have the users pay for the upgrades um, and uh, understood that it could be served without a loop uh, through a stat right away. Uh, you talk about backyard easements, all of our, or a lot of our uh, wastewater uh, in uh, the Clearwater subdivision as backyard easements, and it, it is possible to do. But my concern is that it's going to be a long, long time to uh, get the water out to Cars Landing from there. And, and I understood there was a, a master plan that uh, was done some time ago before uh, before 2005, I think, because uh, it was done when I, I wasn't mayor, but I heard of it. And it looked at extending a trunk uh, at the upper level along Barclay Road instead of Cars Landing Road to get out to the north end of our community and, and either have another reservoir and a pump system there and loop all of those little water systems uh, to the uh, upper level one so that uh, distribution was by gravity instead of pumping from the uh, trunk on cars landing up into. And so I don't see how Barclay is going to be served by a trunk line along cars landing road out to uh, uh, the north end of our community. I would like to see what that master 
plan uh, uh, was, I, d I didn't see it because the uh, uh, potential users at the time decided it was going to cost too much, but I had her to figure in the two million dollar range to serve everybody along Barclay Road, including out uh, uh, the commonage to the to the other development where the Hereford and Charlet roads are. So I, I'd like to see what that plan was about because I I really have difficulty in in uh, just seeing how um, spending two million dollars now to get water to seven how many properties in there that will be served by that uh, when we're sort of abandoning the north end of our community till some time in the future I don't know what the what the cost is to get water out there but um, if you're pulling it all from Beaver Lake that means no reservoir and uh, no pump system. Uh, maybe that's uh, cost effective, but uh, certainly the water systems that are at the with the reservoirs at the higher elevations uh, and uh, gravity distribution seem to be uh, money saving in the in the long term. So the, I I would like to see more information on why. This is the preferred option, or the, it seems like the only way it could be done when, when you could service in much quicker time and at l much less cost um, from the Lake Pine system. And even if it's short term, it, until we can look at doing an upper level trunk that um, would serve all of the north end of our community with um, a big project that we'd certainly have to go after a lot of grant money for, but that's been done before and it uh, certainly could be done again. And I don't know what the time frame would be, but it would uh, it would serve the uh, much larger community. So I I have a particular concern with with this as a uh, a short term fix for a fairly high cost when we don't really know that we're going to be able to add uh, what it would take to get it out to Cars Landing anyway, in terms of what the cost would be. So I, I don't know what the rest of council thinks, but I, I'd like to see more information on how we're going to serve the north end apart from these properties that were mobily water system and and orphaned from the open uh, lake pine system so that's my issue I, I really don't want to go petitioning people to see whether this is something that uh, they're prepared to pay uh, a million or so almost two million dollars for in that small area we're talking new users presumably if i could speak to that yeah yeah so we have looked at that numerous ways on what's the most efficient way to service the mobile users they front and most of them front an existing water system and that existing water system is the beaver lake system and in order to supply them the we have looked at that and the most efficient way is off our Beaver Lake source. As far as servicing out Barclay Road and that area, that was reviewed as part of the Cars Landing servicing strategy, which was brought to council this fall as, as part of a uh, strategy session. So we do have a plan in place that addresses extending the water system out Cars Landing. We do, we are looking at that, but the Moberly system, we did fold into that Cars Landing review and it still made the most sense to service those properties off Cars Landing Road. And how are you going to get up the hill to them? They would run a service line off Cars Landing Road. Now, as I alluded to in my presentation, lots one and two are requesting 
to be serviced off of the Lake Pine system because of the challenges they have of running a service line off of Cars Landing Road. And as would anybody on that hill. So the, uh, they would have to, uh, and be pumped up to there. I don't understand. Uh, Councillor Scarrow. I'm thinking along, I'm thinking along the lines of our, our mayor, Kyle, and, and uh, you tell us that the cost, most cost effective way of servicing those properties is through uh, Beaver Lake Water. And, uh, I, you know, I got to, you know, concede to the professionals there. But I think what we're talking about or James is, uh, is concerned about is when in the future we do go to service the upper lands, Barkley and Cominich and stuff like that, which we will have to do one day. Um, will that require an awful lot of pumping and will that pumping add cost to our our district's uh, water bill every year, so, so to speak? Eh? And even is it possible uh, to to service those areas in the future? Um, I, I'm kind of along with James where I think gravity fed is more cost effective long term as compared to pumping. And uh, it seems to me if we put the line down the cars landing road corridor that we're going to be pumping. So those are my thoughts. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and just quickly show the cars landing servicing strategy. So essentially, the cars landing servicing strategy for expanding the system out to the north as you guys are discussing, relies on using the Upper Lake Pine Reservoir. Now, what we looked at was using either a high pressure trunk to get it up there, and that's using the gravity system, or building a pump station down here. Now, the pumping cost we're talking is in terms of what we did do a 20 year life cycle on that, whether you run a high pressure trunk main or whether you use build a pump station, we're talking the difference of a million dollars in a $20 million capital project. So uh, to answer that, no, we don't have any concerns and that would be supplied off our gravity system and using the pump system. But how about connecting to them? How do you, how do you connect uh, the uh, upland properties to a trunk line on cars landing. So basically it's a pressurized system and the pressure forces the water up to their property. Um, but, but what if, what if they don't what if they don't own all the property between them and their use? I mean how do how do they get the service? you'd run services to the property line. So I, I'm not sure it's certain I'm fully understanding the question or the but issue here. There could be uh, in, uh, if, uh, if you're looking at the trunk line on cars landing road, and you're trying to get water to the uphill side of Barkley Road, there could be two or three different landowners in between. So how is, the how they're going to run a service line through somebody else's property all the way along Barclay. I, I don't. You say you don't want to do backyard connections, but how do, how do you get the water to a private user all the way uh, above uh, to a user above Barclay Road. Greg, Greg Buckles is requesting to speak. Maybe he can articulate this a little better than I can. OK, let's hear from. Good evening. Good evening, Your, your Worship, uh, Mayor uh, and Council. Um, I, I think a couple key points here. So one thing um, we are looking to do. So the existing Lake Pine system is a pump system. We pull from Okanagan Lake. 
Uh, we moved that up to a lower reservoir, which has another booster station, which moves the water up to an upper reservoir. And then from there, it, it, it cascades back down uh, to provide the pressure we need to provide service. That lower pump station, Okanagan Lake, is, um, is uh, very, very difficult for us to access and something we're looking to, to get um, uh, removed if we can connect to Beaver Lake. Uh, the other thing in, that, that Kyle talked about was a small pipe diameter. We need to upsize those pipes um, regardless. Uh, and for two reasons. One, they are they are too small, so they do not provide the fire protection to a lot of those a lot of those homes that are currently out there. And secondly, it, it, it's it, it's getting old. Those small diameter pipes are prone to to breakage and 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 uh, um, failure, as as we just saw happen on Hare Road. So this is a big part of our small diameter pipe replacement strategies is to go in and replace these things to provide the, the service capacity they should, but also to reflect the fact that they're getting old and they need to be replaced. So we need to do that regardless. And, and, and the cost options we provided um, is such that, you know, uh, for council's discretion, would you put all of that on the Lake Pine utility or would we have you know, the existing water ratepayers pay for the portions that were replacement and then just have Lake Pine Utility pay uh, for the portion that was would be outside of that. And that would be the lowest cost option for that local service area. What that would mean is that we have to advance those other works now uh, for the existing users. And so that was one of the options that, that Kyle provided. The, the overall servicing strategy ultimately is is again to feed all of cars landing or have that potential feed all of cars landing from okanagan lake and what we do is we intercept rather than pump it up from okanagan lake we, we we supply from a gravity supply from beaver lake that then moves to that lower uh reservoir that i talked about with the booster station in it so we have considered this and looked at this quite extensively um Granted, it is somewhat complex and, and a bit a bit convoluted in terms of how this is all laid out. Um, you know, as as we've talked about throughout, servicing out in Cars Landing is an expensive proposition. The, the houses are spread out. We don't have the densities, and there's a lot of pipe that we need to put in. So the ultimate sol solution to feed. Uh, uh, the, the, the broader cars landing area relies on that existing infrastructure of reservoirs and so on and then having to take mains out down Barkley Road to feed all the way down cars landing so it is using existing infrastructure to the best extent that we can providing servicing um, from a water source in the most efficient way and having the ability to service future needs uh, in, in the most effective way possible so that's that's what we're kind of presenting the the issue that we ran into when we when we're talking about these backyard easements is we couldn't secure them if we had, had been able to secure them we you know we would have proceeded on that basis but we we could not so we had to find another strategy and and that meant going into road dedications and in, in, in areas where we did have ability to put that that pipe in as as we have those road dedications um so that, that probably ends my my comments yeah well it, it it still seems to me that uh you're talking that big dollars to uh service a few properties that um and and abandoning a, a functioning system uh for something that uh, uh isn't how are you going to serve uh the Lake Pine utility uh, from Cars Landing Road. If you're abandoning the uh, the reservoir system, we're not abandoning the reservoir system. We're continuing to use those reservoirs. All we're changing is our source, and we're changing our source from a, a pump station on Okanagan Lake. That again, we can't. We've got to, you know, we should maybe <laughs> take council out. We have to go down a long series of, of, of stairs just to get to it. So there's no truck access to it. There's no vehicle access to it. You know, at some point we could get 
confronted with Interior Health saying you need, you know, you need to do uh, UV systems like we put on Cow Lake and Okanagan Lake and some of our others. So we really, we really view that pump station as a as a major liability, uh, uh -huh. a costly liability. How are so you we, getting? The, how are you getting the water into the uh, Lake Pine reservoirs then? There's, we just tie into the pipe. We tie into the pipe that crosses from uh, across uh, Cars Landing Road, and we 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 tie, we do an inner tie into that pipe, and it and has the pressure to get up to our to our booster station. You can you can get Beaver Lake water into the Lake Pine Reservoir without a pump. Well, we've got two options to do that. Either we use a, a, another booster station which would replace that that lower uh okay lake pump house a small booster station or we we use the pressure main ultimately as, as kyle was talking about and the pressure main um comes from where beaver lake and, and along cars landing road hmm. it's there now is that part of the artist system Yes. yes, but again, it needs upsizing because it's it's undersized and it's at the end of its useful life. So you're doing a whole lot of uh, upgrading to serve how many more people? No, that we need to do anyhow. The upgrading needs to happen anyhow. Yeah. And when? Right before it breaks. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. We'd be looking to advance it with the income at the same time as servicing the Moberly properties, the Moberly local service area properties. And when will that be done? James? Yeah, uh, just, Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the presentation. Um, we've all got lots of questions, I think. Um, but the big one I have is um, what is, you know, first of all, it, it sounds from what I read that this is not in the five year plan right now. It's not in our five year budget plan. And and maybe Tanya is the one to comment on this. Um, I want to know what is the impact on the users? How many users are there? I can't remember uh, the number. Uh, and also, um, so what's the impact on those users in terms of their what they have to pay approximately and then what will be the impact on the general taxpayer of each of those options i see the general but you know the general dollar figures but you know what what's the tax if we pick one option over the other two what's the impact approximate on the the um the general taxpayer if if the general taxpayer is going to contribute so that would help to make a decision on which sure. option they're going to sure. pick. So the uh, the plan is not included in our five year capital plan, so it would be coming back as part of the budget deliberations of 2022. Um, if we are looking at cost per property, it's 16 properties in total. OK, so using option one where they pay for it all, it's $111,000 per property. Okay. If we look at option two, where they do the portion of the water mains that front their property and we handle the portion to the south, that works out to approximately $65,000 per property. And then if we further, we share the portion of the existing water mains and fronts their system, it works out to $52,000 per property. Again, we do need to refine these costs and, and look at it a little yes. closer, but this is a class D cost estimate the best we have right now. Now that costing would be spread over time as well, would it not? Uh, part of a local service area, they can either choose to spread it out over time and they pay interest or they can pay up front. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, thanks for the questions. It has helped a lot and thanks for your answers. Um, I'm going to throw some more at you because that's me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, you started off, Carl, by mentioning that two of the properties now want to step out of that agreement. So does that change the number of properties from tw from 16 to 14 if that happens? Correct. OK, so then that will change those numbers that you've just given us. 
correct, and I have those numbers if you'd like them. Oh, go for it. Go on. <laughs> OK, so if we take lots one and two out, and uh, granted, if we do do that, if the council elects to make that decision to service them the same way that lots three and four are done, it would be done contrary to the district standards and contrary to the district subdivision servicing bylaw. So I just want to make council aware of that. But if they choose to do that, if the council so chooses to do that, the 14 lots, so if using option one where they pay for it all, it works out to approximately $117,000 per property. Mm -hmm. They go down to option two, it drops down to, option two is a wash, it works out to the exact same amount per property, $64,000, $65,000 per property. And if we go with option three, where we're splitting the portion of the main, they handle that it's a shorter portion of new water main that needs to be installed. It actually works, it's, it's beneficial. It works, goes down to $50,000 per property. Okay. Thank you, Mike, that's brilliant. Um, my next question would be, um, okay, so I've got another two questions. The first one is um, our CAO made the comment that he would prefer or recommended pointed to option three because he said it was closer to the original um, servicing agreement. And I wondered whether that was a cost similarity or a model uh, formula similarity. Because my follow up question would be if we went for option three, where there is a shared cost for upgrades to existing pipe, would that apply when we're looking to extend into cars landing? because on the original uh, strategy that came before council um, on the Cars Landing Water Master Plan, the East Side Utilities area would pay for 100% of the upgrades to their particular section. So I'm just looking for whether that is, we're being consistent there in those models with option three. So I wonder if Alberto would like to speak to his comment first before I address this the two second part there well my only comment there is that uh, um, the, the option three reflects more the original lsa that we had approved uh, yeah. in 2017 both in uh, uh, in financial considerations but also in size of the um, of the works um, with this new strategy we are adding onto uh, onto the original proposal, uh, both on the north and the south of uh, uh, those uh, lots, and therefore I thought that uh, that would be probably more to service the community in general than uh, than just those 16 lots. And so I would say, uh, in my mind, it would be uh, probably more accurate. Uh, uh, a more accurate picture uh, if we if we had option three being approved. That's, okay. that's my consideration. Okay. But the extent of the option, extent of the proposed option, including lots one and two, would be the same extent as we're proposing now under this new servicing. The what the line still has to get to one and potentially get to one and two. Yeah. If, no, we, if we adopt the current servicing strategy, they would have to come off Cars Landing Road. Okay. So yeah, my question then would stand as to saying how, given the additional support of DLC taxpayers to share the cost of the upgrades to existing pipe in front of the lots to the north of the southern section, um, would that similar process be applied if we were looking into um, the cars further into the cars landing strategy? So East Side Utilities and Coral Beach. Yeah, so the Cars Landing servicing strategy did recognize the deficiencies along Cars Landing Road that would need to be upsized in order to connect Lake Pine Utility, and that was not included in what was called Phase 3, where we extend out to the north and their cost calculations. But then in this option 3, just to clarify, this the, um, the district is covering the upgrades that are necessary to the south, and the, um, the service area is covering the new water mains, but you're sharing the cost of upgrades to existing water mains. So when you come out to Cars Landing, there are existing water mains, but that cost was passed on to the East Side Utility users. So I'm just wondering whether the same process would apply if we go with option three 
Um, I'm not sure how the DRC taxpayers would feel about that, but I know the Lakevine people, uh, some Roby people would be very happy with option three. Um, but would we be consistent with that when we go out to Cars Landing? So if you have existing infrastructure that you're upgrading, that cost would be shared between um, the district and the utility users. With the exception of Coral Beach, the everything past uh, Lake Pine Road or north of the Lake Pine system is not owned by the district water utility. So it's not it's not a district water main past that. I understand water. that, but this middle section of option three, where we're sharing the upgrades to existing, that isn't, that is not, is that district Lake Pine system that we're sharing the upgrades to, or is it a different? Tanya is requesting to speak. Um, Tanya can maybe answer that. Is she, uh, Tanya, are you there? Yeah, so I think, um, through your worship, just specific to Councillor Reed's question about whether or not this impacts the recommendations put forward for the Cars Landing um, area. I would suggest that any decision of Council is independent of other decisions. So certainly it would be Council's prerogative to support some kind of subsidization as this is in this process, but any future decisions would be uh, solely of the council of the day to make decisions around whether or not they would choose to subsidize any other systems, whether that be cars landing or any other water system would be the decision of the council of that day. Mm -hmm. But that yeah. doesn't, okay. Yeah. That just doesn't seem very consistent in, in application kind of thing, I suppose, on, on such a on such a significant scale that we're talking about. I just... So part of the Lake Pine servicing strategy did recognize four million dollars worth of improvements on the district system that needed to happen to prior. And that would have that would be folded into a district of Lake current users uh, improvements and not be is not added to the uh, phase three where we expand out to the northern portion of cars landing uh greg is looking also to speak to this okay. uh, yeah. so, so just all of this is at council's prerogative right uh in terms of the costing and we're, we're making recommendations but uh, as, as 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 tanny said it's it's all at, at council's prerogative the the cost sharing we're talking about is where we're is where we're placing where where pipe already exists where the the pipe that that is district owned exists um and and so we're in, in the option c uh, the final option we're saying the utility pays or the the service area pays the full cost of the new pipe and we cost share you know the the area where the, their shared uh benefit and then the the upsizing would be paid by the utility or the rate payers because that needs to happen anyhow. So that's why those three sections are defined in that manner. Yeah, I I, I think I get that and I understand the, the logic behind it. I'm just wondering how that, yeah, I suppose, again, council's prerogative. I was just hoping, that, you know, to get some understanding as to whether that would be equally available when we're considering the cars landing upgrade because we're subsidizing um, one community and not potentially subsidizing another. So I just wanted to see whether we could be equitable in whatever decision we make. Yeah, your worship, that's a determination of council though. I mean, like uh, obviously staff is not able to provide that kind of uh, no. um, political judgment as to what is appropriate for um each individual circumstance so w that's why we give options to council to consider um you know if we if we were to say that uh, uh option one which is everybody pays and the district doesn't pay it uh anything uh that would be my utmost pr preference because obviously <laughs> uh it wouldn't be any burden on on any other taxpayers because we're doing this basically for specifically for that area uh, but by the same token, we recognize that uh, there are improvements that we are making, and so that's that's why we have other two options there. But in the end, the political, social, and economic impact is decided by council, not by staff. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, and very, sorry, very, and it's and, done on an individual basis. So, yeah. um, in the future, when there is another uh, of these situations, council will have to consider in its merits. Okay, I have uh, Councillor Scarrow. Go ahead. Yeah, Blair first, sir. Oh, I didn't have you at all, Blair, um, but I'll take you now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, thank you. A um, couple questions. Uh, first, that uh, four inch district owned pipe that's there now, did we install that or did we inherit that? It was installed uh, as part of the ARTA program or the Winfield Okanagan Center Irrigation District, basically. Okay. Uh, Second is is flow for fires. Um, how is the fire flow in that area? With the four inch, does it work? Or do we rely on the lake pine system for that? What do we do? What's fire protection like in that area? Currently in that area, it's deficient. It's deficient, so. We uh, have a six inch in lake pine. Okay, or but either. I'm asking. Yeah, you, what you're saying, we don't have fire flow in lake pine? I, I believe his question was about the four inch pipe on Cars Landing Road. No, no, well, that was yeah, but I asked question. where we would service a fire from. So, does Lake Pine currently give us enough flow for fire? I mean, it's close enough to there that I guess it, it could serve as firefighting. I'm not sure. Well, I guess it isn't actually. So, any fire that's along that road, well, to be a water user or not, anybody that's on the west side of that road is currently at risk from insufficient flow. Would that be correct? Cur correct. Our, our current four inch diameter pipe along Cars Landing Road is deficient. OK. It's, it's badly deficient. And yeah, yeah, when you consider all those homes on my crate and everything else, they yeah, there's there's uh, you, 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 you wouldn't you wouldn't be uh, meeting the, uh, the the FUS recommended standards uh, by a long shot. So I, I don't suppose that there's any um, all because none of those people will be water users. Uh, I don't suppose there's any ability to have them pay into a system which helps protect their homes. They are connected to the system now. Oh, they? Yes. And the lower side of the road is? Yes, and that's that, and that's why we're saying that that line needs to be replaced regardless. OK. So but they don't they wouldn't have to pay for any of the upgrade, even though it's benefiting them as well. As as part of the rate pairs, they do right. All all the rate pairs would oh, be okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I see it as, as part of the entire rate pay package. All right. No. Okay, it gets a little confusing, but I'll just say quickly that uh, I support option two. Um, I think that we have to pay a part of it. Uh, I'd like to keep that to, you know, wherever we can. I I think that. Uh, the options for uh, servicing lot one and two, I would like to see them in our water system. I'd like to see everybody in our water system. Um, you know, I, I don't know how possible that is, but that's what I'd like to see. And um, so going forward, I I would support option two. Okay, thank you. I have um, uh, Councilor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Obviously, uh, um, pretty in-depth subject here. Um, lots of, uh, again, lots of moving parts. So, um, you know, if we're deficient somewhere, uh, that's sort of on us to uh, to to make this work for them. So, um, I I too uh, like option B. So, um, uh, I, I think that uh, the district should uh, should spread out some of that uh, cost as well. Um, and not have uh, everything uh, on the shoulders of the uh, taxpayer. So just my thoughts. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Cozen, and then you, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, we did a lot of talking about this and uh, I didn't do any, <laughs> but um, I thought that we would, I thought uh, that we would have very little discussion about this and that we would move forward with uh, option three, but I see that some of the other councillors are, are uh, not agreeing with that, but I would stick my uh, support on option three as our best way to move forward. We know we have to, 
fix the pipe. It's old. It's it's I don't want to say it's rotten, but it's probably getting getting quite brittle. And uh, having made one that's dug up many of these pipes in the past, I know what it can be like for the guys, especially on New Year's Eve or something like that. So I do want to see this get replaced. However, we do go about replacing it, but I do support option C. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Scar. Well, I definitely supported option C when I began, and uh, now I'm torn between option B and option C, but I do believe that the deficiency that exists today within our existing pipe should be paid for by us. I, I also agree that uh, subsidy is in order here due to our lack of infrastructure to, to to get the job and i don't see the users as i don't see option one as an option at all quite quite frankly eh? um i wanted to talk a little bit about kara's concern about consistency uh on at applying these types of things eh? and uh i agree with uh the others that have said that every decision we make is independent and i could believe that the future when it brings these questions to the future councils the set of circumstances will be entirely different and the solution could also be entirely different so um, to describe my final feelings I think I'm going to support option three mostly because it offers a more of a subsidy for those and it gets this project started and Kyle's made me comfortable with the fact that in the future we could service Barkley Road through the pumping up to the reservoirs as they've described and uh, in the future perhaps taking another capital project out along Barkley. So uh, option two would be acceptable to me. Option three is kind of where I put my heart. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I... Could Your Worship, uh, uh, Councillor Gamble is requested. Oh, Councillor Gamble had her hand up. Okay, I didn't see it, sorry. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do uh, also support option uh, three or C. Um, I think that um, uh, this is a difficult situation and uh, and uh, the pipe definitely needs upgrading. Uh, and I think that, that, that the, the big portion of it is our responsibility here. Um, definitely these people have been waiting some time to get the water. Uh, for their property, some of them have. Um, so, um, I I would think that that is the best solution. Now, we don't know the details on this, but other than what we've heard, so and and one question that Kyle might be able to answer, and that is, uh, is there any opportunity to get any kind of uh, matching funding or anything like that, any grant for this type of thing? Currently, with the grant programs that are out, no. The, no. the grant programs that we're looking at right now, we're looking at our wastewater treatment plant and a future water treatment plant. Yeah. But it is something we need to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dr. Reed? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think I would support option three with the, um, and I would support the request from properties one and two to join via Lake Pine, if that was something that was technically feasible, um, because it would reduce the cost of servicing to both the Mobley area and to the district. My question for Tanya would be, what is the, what is the per household cost to the ratepayer of option two and option three? I just was interested to see what that number would look like. Or maybe Kyle has it. Kyle has it. Ah, he's, he's, take, he's taking a uh, uh, I'm <laughs> scrambling. <laughs> um, so we have approximately 4,000 accounts. So... Works out to approximately 200 to $300 per, per account. Okay. And would that be spread over time or is that something that they, it all gets occurred in one year? So that would come out of the water capital reserve likely, of which there is fairly significant reserves in the water capital. So that would be used to fund it. I mean, water users fund 
holistically a, a significant amount into the water reserve, water capital reserve annually. So those funds would come out of that. So it wouldn't actually go, go on the bottom of anybody's bill? No, it would form part of the existing uh, water capital reserve. Fantastic. I definitely support option three. Then. Councillor uh, Ireland was next, but it, it, if he's letting me go next, I'll, I'll say that uh, being a water quality guy, I'll say, well, damn, I'll push option three. Sorry, are you moving that? Uh, moving it. I'll move option three. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I can support option three as well. The, the, um, although I would not support uh, not servicing one lots one and two and Kyle answer this question for me if we allow them to be supported through the other system that's not going to lessen our costs we still want to push that water main out to where it ends on the map is that correct we would stop prior to uh, lot four that water main extension so it would actually cost us less money it it, does, it is a lower cost project if you extend the water main a, less of a distance on Cars Landing Road and service lots one and two via the Lake Pine system. So we would you would uh, would you guys support that plan? I mean, what's what's the recommendation from you guys? Maybe Greg could speak to this, or you speak to that. So I think um, Kyle and I talked about it and this this just kind of came up and here's the pros and cons. So if we extend if we extend the water main down, we you know, um, we extend our, our, our fire protection down that little bit further, which is a good thing. Um, obviously, there's the downsides. It, it costs more. Uh, the property owners have said it's very difficult for them to bring the service line up there at that at that location. Um, We've got uh, we've got a large pipe that runs for quite a length that services only a couple of homes, and there's a problem with that in terms of maintaining water quality and chlorine residuals. Um, so the dead end pipes like that, that's not a great thing. Um, so there's always kind of compromises you make when you look at these things. So I think we're comfortable with it probably either way. Um, I know that the the property owner uh, is is very uh, eager to have a, a a solution that comes off a of lake pine, it, you know, and and you know it, it again it, it it's we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to make that decision as a staff because it doesn't follow our our standards, um, but I think in this instance there you know because you're running the pipe for such a long distance, uh, really to service two homes, um, it's you know, you could make an argument. Well, maybe that's not the most efficient way to do it. Maybe they should be able to be given an opportunity to bring a service line off the top if, if they if they acquire the right of ways from neighboring properties in order to do that. And really what they're getting is a potable supply at that point um, and, and, and not fire protection right in front of their homes. But that would be could be reflected in their own insurance rates that they pay. So we we could support it. We could see um, we could see it definitely either way. That that would certainly be my preference. Well, that's I mean, I'm fine either way then. If if we're going to stop the pipe before there, um, yeah, save a couple bucks anyways. Um, I, I'm fine with that. I just would remind us that all, you know, if we go for option three and, and take more money out of our water reserve, that's all great. But we have a really large bill coming down the pipe. It all everybody's going to have to pay and we're hoping that we get a grant, but we're hoping. Because water treatment is going to cost what, Kyle? What's water treatment going to cost us? Current estimates just to build phase one of the plant, I believe, are approximately $22 million. $22 million. So, uh, you know, every dollar we take out of our water servicing is a dollar that uh, we can't spend for treatment that we're going to have to try to get from someplace else. I just I would like just to remind council too though in, in terms of our water master plan we do have an allotment for uh, infrastructure renewal 
And so it is, you know, one of the things we'd be looking at focusing is that infrastructure renewal with with, you know, these small pipe diameters, these 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 older pipes. So there is $17 million for infrastructure renewal in that in that 20 year plan. OK, well, then I'm good with option three. So your worship, are we uh, doing option three with the exclusion of lot one and two? Is that the intent of uh, Can we do a service connection from uh, uh, from Lake Pine Road and to serve one and two, and uh, I think I don't know if there are a couple of others to know that, but it, it the service distance is less to one and two from uh, that uh, easement road than it, uh, the distance from uh, Cars Landing Road up to their to their property line. Yeah, so. But how big a pipe can you put a hydrant on a pipe that comes down the stat right away? Kyle? We would only be looking to provide them a service line off a of lake pine and not not run a, a water main down that that statutory right away because in order to do that we need to upsize the pipe quite quite a distance back. I see. I thought, oh, uh, it, it impacts the rest of the lake pine system. Correct. I thought it was uh, a six inch pipe would uh, go anywhere, but uh, not down there. All right. Um, yeah, if if we could get uh, water soonest to uh, one and two, we uh, three and four are actually in the Lake Pine system, so you don't have a difficulty with that. Um, you have. Councillor Reid. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to clarify, at some point, though, we will be going down past lots one and two if we move down to Cars Landing. So the water main will continue on at some point. And so if we excluded them, we'd be starting from lot four and going north. And if we included them, we'd start from the end of lot one and going north. Is that correct? Yes. OK. And the cost that we're talking about. Oh, no. Sorry, no. no. Our current servicing strategy drops down off of uh, Barclay Road at some oh. point. Cars landing. OK, got. Thank you. Um, and just the cost we're talking about is that to the lot line so that the property owner would then have to pay an additional sum to get yeah. connected. Yeah, correct. They have to run their own private water line in. OK. Thank you. All right. Just just before we move, I think there's one other thing because this was this this new servicing strategy really just came to us today for lots one and two. Um, I think we just we need to look a little bit about the the you know what's what's required to to, to include them into the into the Lake Pine utility. Um, and 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 what that means, what those costs might be, um, and 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 so I think. If 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 we go that way, then we we probably need to come back. We probably need a little bit more work just to see how that all. Just make sure we're not missing anything. Um, and I, but I think you know that gives us clear direction. We can we can start to wrap some of the other stuff up, make it a little bit clearer, and then and then probably bring it back to council one more time. Just here's here's how it works. Wouldn't it simply be a case of a connection fee, or um, I mean, I presume. Two, uh, three, and four have paid to be in the service, yes. and uh, but one and two. Mr. Mayor, Tanya has a comment. Yeah. Um, Tanya, you comment on that? Yeah. So there is definitely more work that needs to come back to council because we would have to uh, create a petition to get them into the local service area for Lake Pine. So one and two have to go through a petition process. Um, they do still need to pay a connection fee as well. We'd have to look at that, but there is a required process to get them into that local service area. OK, not just a case of asking like three and four did. It is asking, but it's also amending the bylaw, which is why it needs to come back in front of council again. OK, really good. And that. Do we refer uh, that you need a separate motion for that? We already have a motion on the table for option three. Your Worship was moved by Councillor Kozab and seconded, I believe, for, by Councillor uh, Gamble. Yeah. Okay, but that doesn't 
say anything uh, Councillor Arlen could support that if one and two were oh, I don't Okay. We should create a separate motion that removes one and two from the strategy. Yeah, if okay. if if council uh, feels strongly about removing lot one and two, then we can have a separate motion on that. But right now we have option three on the table. Okay. Councilor. Yeah, I don't think we should. Uh, in this case, I think we should just approve option three, and then. Uh, what if it doesn't work? What if, if the lake line does not, you know, if that whole thing doesn't work for some God be known reason, but, you know, let's face it, the whole thing didn't work from all the plans that we've laid up till to, to now. So I think we should just leave that out of there and, and uh, see how we go. And then if there, if there becomes an issue that we have to add them to either system, that will have to come back before us anyway. So if, uh, if everybody agrees, I think that's, <laughs> Yeah, and by the way, this is the start of the process anyway, so we have yeah. to go through a, a petition process. You have to approve bylaws. Yeah. And so let's just leave option three as is, as reads. Go and call the question. Yeah. Okay. Question. Those in favor? Yeah. Aye. Three. Yeah. Opposed? I'm not opposed, but I do want to see provision made for a quicker fix. I don't. Oh, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> We've had four overdose deaths since he was sick. <laughs> no, I was just asleep. I didn't. Uh, no, but somebody tried to bring down a couple more APIs. <laughs> <laughs> well, the things that try to write them down. Something that doesn't tell Protection services. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'll be brief. I know everybody's probably eager to get home at this time of the night. Mm -hmm. um, this is our annual report for 2020 for protective services. Um, as you can well imagine, it was like everybody in the community, a, a trying year for the fire department. Um, I'll start off with this slide. This is Carl Featherstone who passed away in 2020. Uh, he had a sudden cardiac event at home um, oh, yeah. and he'd done, um, I believe it was four calls within about 12 hours prior to the event. So work safe BC is considered a line of duty death and the federal government is denoting it as a line of duty death is for uh, for him as well. That helps them. It does. There's financial compensation uh, through the uh, work safe BC. Uh, his wife and two kids uh, will get a pension and he will get a cash award from the federal government and our uh, firefighter insurance because it was considered a line of duty death will also pay her a uh, 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 amount of money um, for life insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so emergency calls for 2020 were down um, partially due to um, the health orders that started out with COVID. There was a concern uh, of or two twofold concern. One was that uh, the province was going to run out of personal protective equipment. Uh, that there wouldn't be adequate for the hospitals in addition to emergency responders. So they decided that um, there should be a reduction in the types of calls that we went to. So we were very restricted initially. Uh, subsequently, um, they have um, acquired more PPE and as a result, uh, they um, were starting to see some bad outcomes and we talked or you mentioned uh, about uh, overdoses. We were not being responded to overdoses and this was resulting in a, a lot of deaths in all communities in BC. So the um, uh, provincial health uh, has eased the restrictions um, pretty much back to where we were uh, before COVID uh, as far as medical calls for us. Uh, Instant by station, uh, station 71 is obviously the busiest uh, it normally is. Uh, 583 calls, station 8130, uh, station 91, which is Oyama, 124 calls. Um, 
this is just an example of for every medical call that we go on, uh, we have to outfit ourselves with, uh, we use either these blue uh, smocks or um, uh, Tyvek suits, uh, N95 uh, respirators and face shields. And we have to do that for every call. And there's a strict protocol by health that we have one individual go into a house, a second individual sits on the doorstep, and um, we go through a number of questions and that to see whether this is a COVID related type call. Uh, if it is, generally the one person will work with uh, one DC ambulance attendant with that patient. If it's not, then the full crew uh, quite often will go in if it's a, a cardiac event or something like that. <clears throat> Uh, one thing of note, uh, this year I think for the first time in 2020, uh, the uh, health services has published for all communities in BC um, the number of overdoses that each community has had. And I think the thing to note here was that uh, if you look at 2019, we had 24 overdoses in Lake Country, 2020 we had 47. Um, not all of them were negative outcomes, um, but a lot were. Um, so it's increased substantially. All firefighters are trained to administer nioxone and all of our apparatus carry it. We use it multiple times. Um, often we are at, at calls, uh, drug overdose calls prior to the ambulance. So we uh, we often are, are giving those syringes. Todd had a question. You want to take questions now? Or you Certainly. Want to go, them all? Yep. go ahead, Todd. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and uh, Thank you for uh, the presentation so far. I just uh, felt um, I should clarify on the overdoses because um, I got asked by a council, um, an actual counselor, um, the medical kind, um, that uh, you know he's he's suggesting that uh, is this um, technically overdoses or is this unexpected? toxicity as he calls it so just more of a reaction um can you maybe just clarify if that's uh if he's correct in that my understanding um there may be a few in here where there are accidental overdoses uh, such as a prescription drug that is being uh, issued by a physician and they maybe don't follow the directions properly but I think from my experience in the community that 99% of them would be illicit drugs. And the one thing I didn't mention is that most of these overdoses are occurring in single family residences. Um, unlike probably Kelowna where I would say a good percentage are on downtown streets in some of these homeless shelters and that, here we're seeing it in, in single family homes, uh, a member of the family, um, is using uh, illegal drugs and they're being mixed with fentanyl and different things like that. Okay, so thanks. So I just uh, also wanted to mention that um, our uh, our petition that we sent in was um, was um, brought out in the um, house there um, by Tracy, and um, so uh, I'm quite uh, proud that it uh, made it to that uh, to that point. So. Um, you know, this is a very important thing that uh, we need to make sure that uh, that number is only going to go up. So uh, I really want to make sure we focus on doing what's right in our community because uh, it's on both sides of us. And uh, I think it's just a matter of time as our as our um, uh, Mr. Collins told us uh, last week that it's just a matter of time before we see it in our community. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fire losses for the year 2020, uh, they were up uh, fairly substantially from 2019, 1,150,500. 98% were structure fires, 2% were vehicle. So that's a bit of a flip, uh, well, not even a flip, but in 2019, it was 64% structures, 35% vehicles. And uh, we have 1% there, which were structures as a result of a wildfire. And 2018 were 71% structures, 29% vehicles. So predominantly structure fires in 2020. Uh, this is uh, one of the significant events. Uh, we got requested um, for the Christie Mountain Fire down in Penticton, and we were requested by the province to supply an engine with a four person crew. Um, in fact, they, when they arrived on scene, they were actually directed to fight the uh, house fire 
the house that actually ended up being destroyed in, by that fire. So the crews were there for a number of days, um, 88 hours I think they were there for. Um, the deputy chief and myself were requested uh, the following day by the province to act as what's called a task force leader. So the fire was divided into two, two sections. Uh, task force leader is appointed for each of the two sections. So we're working uh, with engine companies um, from the different fire departments. I think I had uh, eight different fire departments represented in my zone. And we had about 60 uh, wildland firefighters in, in my zone alone, let alone the north zone. So um, it's a very good experience for all of our people when we get uh, called in by the province to uh, assist them on these calls. And we do make a few dollars. Uh, some of the training that we did manage to carry out this year, um, you know, obviously ice rescue. Um, we uh, did some live fire, uh, which we were required to do to kind of complete some of our uh, recruit firefighters. Uh, intervention courses, uh, UTV, which we purchased a new one last year, so we certify them under Canada Safety. Uh, incident Command, Emergency Scene Management, Chainsaw Safety, and some of the other ongoing initiatives that we're doing. So even though we've been very restricted on our training, um, we are still completing training. We went back about three weeks ago uh, to training in lieu of Monday night, we've been practicing four nights a week, Monday to Thursday, and we're dividing the crews up to, into smaller crews. Uh, some of the other training, Fire Officer One, um, we, you can see the numbers of staff that um, participated in them. Um, and some of the courses are quite long. The Fire Instructor One is a 20 hour course, Fire Officer eight hours, um, apparatus professional driving, which we are accredited to uh, teach in-house. That's a four-day program. Um, and then uh, the deputy and myself took uh, the group division supervisor training, which is really uh, gives us the ability to be um, act as the incident commander at any um, fire within the province for structural uh, protection um, being called upon by the province. Couple of programs, a home safety program. Uh, we were given uh, by the manufacturer in BC Fire Chiefs 900 smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. Um, we distributed 600 within the community. Um, these were people um, within our community or very close to our community uh, that didn't have them. We shared 300 of them to uh, some of the other fire departments um, within the valley here. And uh, fire prevention week in October, normally we go into the schools for a couple of days. Uh, this year, because obviously with COVID we couldn't, so we were doing handouts for the teachers and the students. Um, fire inspections, uh, we had 88 new businesses, 423 uh, regular inspections, 29 pre-plans, which are a computerized plan the crews use when we get a fire in a building, and public education events for three. So. We were busy uh, in 2020 with the inspection program. Some of the service awards, so the ones on the left, they completed their first year, full year after their um, training period. So the training period is about five months. Uh, 10 year period, Glenn, Glenn Gregory at Station 71 and a 20 year fire service award, uh, Bruce from Station 81 in Cars Landing. Uh, some of the capital projects, the regional district replaced all of our auto extrication tools with electric ones um, in 2020. Uh, the new engine 71 was delivered. We have ordered a tender truck in 2020. Um, we expect delivery hopefully before fire season this year. Uh, the new station 71 is obviously under construction and going ahead great guns with the good weather. Uh, FDM, which is an integrated software program, which links us right to the fire dispatch, um, which integrates our payroll, our inventories, our uh, training. We are going, we're hoping to go live with it in the next three to four weeks. Um, the company has been working with us for several months, getting the database uh, installed into the system. Uh, we've been doing training skills maintenance, uh, wildland certification, and safety awareness programs. And finally, uh, a member of the community who has been working with the Boys and Girls Club in Kelowna approached us and uh, wanted to 
He'd taken a look at several of our fire halls and felt that we were lacking somewhat in our exterior lighting. And he came forward with a proposal to donate the lighting, including an electrician to install them. So he did the Oyama fire hall on the exterior and wanted to do some more. And so he completed the Cars Landing fire hall. So there's no, no cost involved to the district at all. And it's all commercial lighting and installed by a certified electrician. So we were very grateful to the individual for doing that. And that completes my report, unless there's any questions. Very good. Well done. Uh, sorry about uh, firefighter demise. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that uh, looks like he's well taken care of. Anyway. Yeah, good. Not there. Scott, I was just wondering, Steve, what did we do for that donor that donated those lights? Did we appreciate him in any particular way? Uh, we have not yet, but we will be. Um, I think that's very important. We do as well. Um, and, and public yeah. yes. recognition. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, do. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to get out and protect the community. <laughs> yeah. Nothing from in camera. Uh, nothing from um, council. Board of Education highlights. Strategic priorities. Uh, notice a motion from uh, Councillor Reed. I've got to read it. You just muted yourself, I think. Okay. Right. Please. Right, I'm going to carefully move over here. Okay, the notice of motion is that the regional district of Central Okanagan be requested to consider a trial project of permitting on leash dogs at Kaloya Regional Park. And I think we had discussed this off leash dogs at Kopchi Regional Park between October the 1st and March the 31st. Um, and that's the motion. Right. Um, I'll second it. Oh, thank you. Seconding? Sure. Yeah. And any further discussion? No. Those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. We'll get on it. Good. Thank you. And um, that uh, did one onliner, Councillor Gamble. What about you? Um, no news at all. Thank you. Okay. Is no news good news? It's good news. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to say. Uh, um, Thanks to uh, to staff for um, for uh, all they've done here. This was uh, a good meeting. We've um, tied up some things that uh, have been lots of hours. So thanks to the uh, staff for uh, for uh, all they are doing there. Um, and uh, I would uh, like to just make a little comment on our um, road stuff. Um, seeing that I just spent. Uh, 11 hours driving along BC roads, counting rocks. Um, so it is definitely lots of rocks on the road. Um, I realize uh, we, we have um, um, some stuff to do in within our within our own borders there. And uh, I just um, like I say, I think we got a little bit more conversation on that to happen yet, but. Um, just wanted to uh, acknowledge everybody's work on it. So thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Koza. Nothing. No wastewater, no <laughs> potable water. Councillor Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, compliment the Lake Country Rotary Club. They did a, uh, you know, they've had a struggle as every organization has raising funds and, and uh, to do the good work that they do. And they did a uh, drive-in lobster dinner thing where you 
drove up to uh, the parking lot here at George Elliott and you picked up your lobster dinner in bags and it had wine and everything, the whole nine yards was in the bag. And, uh, and away you went and uh, they sold it out. It was very effective, it was fun. And uh, hats off to them for coming up with a great way to raise money for the community. Yeah, so And keep it safe. And well, yeah, keep it safe, make, make something different happen. And uh, I think yeah. they did a great job. I never heard about it. That's because they were sold out. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had to beg to get a lobster. All right. And um, yeah, I just kind of like to uh, raise a sore point in my be in my bonnet, so to speak. Eh? Yeah, today we had a council meeting and one of those things that a councillor should do is go down and view the properties that are involved in the council meeting, which I did. My God, Shanks Road is a piece of work that needs work, so much work. And what bothers me most is you get to the part of Shanks Road that's in the city of Kelowna and it's redone, obviously. Now, I don't know if there's any fixing of what's left of Shanks Road, especially in front of the property that we were talking about tonight. The the thing is destroyed. The hunks of pavement are all over the place, and you're probably better off driving down through the orchard. So I'm surely hoping that at some point in the future, we can kind of deal at least partly with that. Thank you. Um, it's um, it been that way for a while. Anyway, we um, come to Council Reed. I think uh, I think uh, the potholes on Shanks Road have been raised before, and they've been filled in before, and uh, that uh, could be a road that could turn into gravel but uh, never know. Uh, Beaver Lake Road seems to be quite good shape. Uh, it? Yeah, but uh, anyway, your worship, are adjourned. Your oh. worship, Council Reed. So I would just one more, one quick councillor item. I just wanted to say thank you to our fire personnel and everybody who's involved in that, both behind the scenes. Um, and that means families at home who um, watch their loved ones go out on these calls at all hours of the, the morning and the night and put themselves at risk for the community. So I just wanted to say thank you to the uh, the staff there at uh, Station 71 and all the volunteers at all the stations. Thank you for that and uh, that we will adjourn. No? Who? Oh, you, Councillor. I was going to ask if the, you, is it um, Councillor Gunn or Councillor Fleming? There she is. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, not much to say. Again, good. Uh, no news is good news. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy about the whole um, dog dogs being allowed on leash. That's a, I think that's a great opportunity for people to get outside more and get some fresh air. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks to the um, all the staff and stuff and. I hope everyone's safe and everyone's have have a good day. Thank you very much, Councillor. Okay. All right, now we are adjourned. Then I think uh, Councillor Fleming not there. No. Good night. Good night. Night night. Sleep tight. <laughs>